symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course we couldn't do it without the hall of famer himself, the greatest professional wrestler of all time, your friend and mine, double J Jeff Jarrett, Jeff, how are you, man? Oh, let's get this show started right in a hot summer. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my world with my host. We couldn't do it without him. The hall of famer himself. Oh my God. That's right. The pod father, Conrad Thompson. What a weird yeah. sentence, man. What a weird sentence. Shoes on the other foot this morning as we, we get cranked up here. So, look, I know you've probably told this story a few times around, but for specifically the My World listeners, and I know we're late to the party or kind of late to the party, uh, but um, I know you hold My World as a special place in your heart. But, no, it all started back with brother love but can you tell us the award can you tell us a little bit about the award you do better explaining much better explaining than i do but no i'd love for the my world listeners to hear exactly what went down uh, i'm not asking you to give yourself your own flowers but tell us about your weekend well i can't believe this is a real thing but uh myself and some of my friends and family traveled to waterloo iowa and uh, we got to spend uh, some time there at the dan gable museum which is unbelievable in Waterloo. Uh, they've got, and I don't know, have you been Jeff? Have you been to that museum before? I have not. Dude, it's unbelievable. All the stuff that's in there. They've got one of the first wrestling rings that was ever used on television and it's T tiny. I mean, maybe eight feet across. I'd be surprised if it's 10. Oh, wow. But I actually took a little private tour with, uh, with, with some celebrities like brother love and JBL <laughs> and Jerry Briscoe. And it was amazing to just walk around and hear all the stories and history that's in there. Uh, some of the hall of fame plaques are just unbelievable, but they've got like, you know, uh, Dr. Death's ring robe and, uh, the little thing that Roddy Piper wore on the front of his kilt and the old school AWA tags and mm. uh, a version of the belt buckle that you got whenever you became the NWA heavyweight champion. And they bronzed one of Harley's boots. I mean, just amazing, really wow. cool stuff. And then there's all the actual amateur wrestling stuff. And I was fortunate enough to go to the basement and see the stuff that they would rotate. So that's everything else they have. Just that's a treasure cool. trove of stuff. I held an actual Olympic gold medal in my hand. Like how many people can say no they've way. Been? Yeah, it's unbelievable the stuff they got there. If you're ever in Waterloo, Iowa, I highly recommend you check it out. And I didn't realize it, Jeff, but the day before I took that tour, I ate breakfast at the corner of a diner there outside on the patio and one block up from that diner is the original hotel where all the promoters got together in 1948 to create the NWA. So that hotel where the NWA was created in 1948, right there. And then of course, Saturday night, man, what a banquet it was. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. I had never been before. It may have been my first visit. It won't be my last visit. And I was lucky enough to go in with quite a class, including Haku and Les Thatcher and Gary Albright. Uh, but unbelievably, I received the Gordon Soley Award. Uh, wow. For in wrestling broadcasting, of course, as you're probably thinking to yourself, self, has Conrad <laughs> ever called a match? I mean, I guess technically I did one for oh, the yeah. NWA a few years ago. But no, that's not what it was about. They said, hey, we need to adopt this new media concept. The world is changing. and and so I guess, you know, I'm the first podcaster in the national wrestling hall of fame, and I don't belong to have that award. Gordon Soley was the first recipient. JR is the second recipient. I'm the third recipient. It was unbelievable. Uh, and, and, and I was fortunate enough to have Bruce Pritchard make an extraordinary effort to be there to induct me. I can't believe that that's a sentence, but it is one that I'm proud of. And, uh, I look forward to going back next year, man. I'm going to make it an annual thing every chance I get. I, you know, congrats. I, 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 words don't put it. I am so happy, so proud for you. Tell me who's in this the two years before, JR. So it's called the Gordon Soley Award. Right. And there's only been three recipients Gordon Soley, Jim Ross, and now myself. Which That's is just pretty high cotton, partner. Dude, I mean, think, think about that. that. I didn't know that till you just spilled that out. Wow. You and JR. It's crazy. It's crazy. And I was so happy to have the opportunity and just thrilled to be there. And 
I, saw I highly that. recommend that you go out of your way to become a member um, and get a lifetime membership. As I understand it, it's only $250, not $250 a year, just one time. I, I'm going to become a lifetime member and hope that a lot of other folks will as well. And uh, yeah, dude, I went in there with Bill DeMont and Haku and Les Thatcher and Gary Albright. And uh, I mean, it was, That's it was cool. something else, man. Whose gold medal did you, did you hold? You know, I'm not sure. I'll be honest. It was in a basement yeah. and they let me, they let, they, you know, I guess they trusted me and I appreciated that, but I, I asked if we could see it and they said, yeah, and they just cut me loose, man. So I got to see, I don't know what I'm allowed to or not allowed to post pictures <laughs> of, but I'll send you some privately, but there was a photo from like the twenties or no, not the twenties. It was 1952 and it was a giant. I mean, like as big as this wall unit behind me photograph of a wrestling ring where they set some sort of all time record over 12,000 fans there with a record gate of over $25,000, which means they were $2 tickets. Yeah. Yeah. But what was cool is they had, even in the cheap seats, people are wearing suits, Jeff. I'm talking about the upper deck. They're suited and booted with a tie and everybody is looking back at the camera and that looking back at the camera I'd never seen before, but instead of everyone looking at the wrestling ring, everyone in the arena is looking at the camera. It was something I've never seen before. It was wow. crazy. I mean, I would love to just have an unlimited amount of time digging around down there. Cause they've just got boxes of yeah. old binders and stuff. And there's no telling like what kind of booking sheets and notes and magazines and things are in there. It is a, a worthwhile venture. Highly recommend that any wrestling fan check it out. That is so cool. You know, it takes, uh, I've got a thousand things going through my mind, but were you just talking about a treasure trove of, of stuff like that? It takes me back to the, one of the first couple of times I used to go to our wrestling office, Nick Goulas over mm -hmm. on Eighth Avenue in Nashville, uh, in the, Gosh, so Conrad, I'm born 60. So I could not have been eight, nine, 10 years old, but going in there and you just kind of see different, obviously in my mind, they were all black and white. Maybe they weren't black and white, but just kind of thinking about the history and then, uh, you know, riding to Louisville with, uh, my grandmother, Tini, she didn't drive. So always had, you know, s s some, uh, somebody driving us. Um, and a lot of times we would have people, but she would sort of go into, history lessons and tell her version of funny stories and stuff like that. But in my mind, as a little kid, my imagination, you just kind of just go back to the history you just brought up. That's so cool, man. Um, now you see it on TV and we're headed to Wembley and a hundred thousand fans, but, uh, or 80,000 fans like I've already grown at 20, but no, but you, you just think back through the years where wrestling came from. God, that's a, a TV wrestling ring. Cool. Anyway, Conrad, uh, I could not wait to get this podcast started today because uh, I just wanted you to tell the story to the My World listeners, and I know you've got multiple podcasts, and Bruce being there was special, and I followed it online like a little kid. JBL uh, posted a nice pic. Anyway, all of it. Very good. Hats off, pal. Hats off, partner. It's, uh, it's it was a great honor. I, 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 um, podcast lineage. I just... Uh... I'll be honest, man. I take a look at, and I'm not saying this to, I'm not saying this tongue in cheek at all, but I take a look and I'm like, how do I belong in this hall of fame before guys like Eric Bischoff? He's not in there yet. Or yourself. You're not in there yet. Like, how is that possible? Um, but you know, I, uh, I told Mr. Briscoe when he first called and told me, you know, what was going on. I said, well, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't think I deserve it. And he said, well, it was unanimous. So you deserve it. And I was like, well, listen, I appreciate that, but I just, I feel weird about this. I don't, I don't know what to say. He goes, you say yes. When somebody calls and asks you to the hall of fame, you say yes. <laughs> but I thought at first when he was asking me if I would come, I was like, yeah, how much are tickets? Yeah. Like, you know, I've always wanted to go. So it's so cool to, to have that opportunity and to be recognized. And I'm, I'm humbled and honored and grateful for the opportunity and I can't believe that I get to do this. You know, part of my speech was, uh, which I didn't write anything. Cause Bruce said, no, we're going to do this backwards from a show. You don't write anything. I'll do all the research and I'll do all the work. And then you just respond to me instead of the other way around. And I was okay. like, okay, we'll do that. Uh, but I said, man, if you would have told me when I was eight years old, that I was going to grow up and get paid to talk about wrestling and be best friends with brother love and Mary Ric Flair's daughter. <laughs> roll Tide. I mean, that's pretty cool. So. 
And hey, we're excited to be here with you hold guys. On, so, so hold on. Is there any way we, we any is this speech online? Can we get a copy? It can is there uh, it's not online? No. I'm gonna work on all that. I'm gonna level up some of that stuff. I'm gonna work on it. Okay. I'm going to get involved is what I'm saying. I, I'm I, Now I can already hear it. You got to be a top guy, folks, to watch the first cut. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I'm like, you. I'm teasing you. You know, I look at every, this is like a, a, a wrestling convention of sorts. And, you yeah. know, I, I've done a few of those. I'm planning to do another one. Labor Day weekend in Chicago, <laughs> Friday, September 1st, Saturday, September 2nd, Sunday, September 3rd. We're going to start making, or as folks are listening to this, we started making talent announcements yesterday. We're going to start rolling out some uh, panel announcements in the coming days as well. But all your AEW favorites are going to be there and a bunch of your favorite Hall of Famers. You know we're going to get Double J down there as well and try to see if we can't get JR and Tony to make the trip. It's going to be a good time. But, boy, you guys are some traveling fools right now. We should Hold mention up, that. I got it. it, it just... So last week at the end of the podcast is when we started talking about StarCast, and it was on our brain because me and you got to catch up prior yeah. to hit and record all this. I got a few texts that wanted the information, and I said, hey, me and Conrad have not. Look, I'm busy. He's busy. I hadn't really followed up, and they just said, you're a liar. You can't tell. And I said, I swear I do not know what he's got up his sleeve. I think I know. I've kind of got a hint, but he hadn't confirmed anything. So, Conrad, I'll just say, pal, StarCast is going to be fun because I already know some of the stuff, and you've still got surprises. So, Well, the one for you is being announced today. Uh, and I know I haven't told you who it is yet, but uh, being who you are in real life, you're listen, going to be excited. So I'm excited. So when you say today, because this drops to the main field. I'm saying today, mine and your today. Today. Oh, oh, I'm ready. I will I, get a text from you that says, what time are they there? Can I do my thing around that time? So okay. I can meet that person. I'll, I'll take that. Hey, okay. That, you've already got me. Can you text it to me? So I, no, I want you to, I, cause I know you're going to, you're going to send me the tweet and do your double exclamation thing or eyeball emojis, or, or we're going to have fun with it. Uh, and speaking of that, we're going to have fun in a couple of weeks. I can't believe this is real. But we're only a couple of weeks away from the release of WrestleQuest. Is that right? So, you know what? He, here's something that um, the Hall of Fame, and I yep. knew you were going. I just got back from San Diego Comic Con. That's right. How was it? When I look at that photo, so you YouTube folks are seeing this, you non YouTube folks, there's me, Sergeant Slaughter, and Jake the Snake. And I don't belong in that group. Um, uh, because you know, those guys, you know, the golden era, I'm an attitude era and, and on and a present day. So you can't put me in that group. I'm not retired yet, but no San Diego comic-con the buzz and look like everything during the pandemic, Conrad, it really, I mean, it just, it was a different deal, but this thing is for those who don't know, San Diego comic-con is the comic-con of all comic-cons in a lot of ways. It, it, it uh, you know, the, the SAG strike and the actors and the movies and all that kind of stuff being on strike in a lot of ways, I think, yes, there were some celebrities that were not there, but the buzz in the building, if you will, all four days was kind of off the charts and a part of that big buzz Conrad. And this is something that me and you are going to have a couple of conversations with this because it was such interesting feedback of where professional wrestling's at that our booth, uh, and not just the, the thing was packed and I'm not just talking because the, the booth was, uh, buzzing and buzzing and buzzing, but the, the game Russell quest and the headlines coming out best wrestling, just, I mean, accolade after accolade, it's won all kinds of awards. August 8th is the drop date, but I'm talking about the executives from major corporations and sponsors and uh the meet and greets we did i don't want to call them meet and greets but you know it the introductions the dinner that we went after uh, afterwards they're just the buzz of of russell quest has exponentially gone up and gone up and gone up and i pinched myself a couple of times thinking are they talking about this same video game that we talked about 18 months ago or however long it was and the pod fathers in it but I say all this to say you went into the hall of fame because I think people, well, we know people it's validation, recognize your work because you lean into 
the eighties and nineties. And yes, we do some modern day stuff and we do TNA stuff and, but the nostalgia part of it, but the storytelling part of it, but Russell quest. And I saw the marketing lines and, and how it came out. And we did, when I say we, me, Jake, um, Sergeant Slaughter and James Deegan, uh, the uh, owner, founder, creator of WrestleQuest, uh, we did a panel and the feedback that we got off that, that one of the marketing, li marketing lines of WrestleQuest is, it's a Japanese role-playing game, but it is a love letter to professional wrestling. Mm. And I thought to myself, self, no, that's what Conrad does. I mean, you peel the layers back and whether it's Jr. or Shivani or, or Bruce or Eric, um, just telling those stories, the deep dive and into it, that it resonates with so many folks and coming by the booth. It's not the first time, certainly won't be the last time, but it just, it was over and over three generations. A lot of times a grandfather and a grandson would come by the booth or whatever it may be. But that was talked about in the panel as well is how resident, uh, how professional wrestling nowadays. And you, you talk about that wrestling ring that you saw that was probably on the air in the fifties, but now it's so multiple generation and it is pop culture. So, uh, Russell quest has, uh, exploded and gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. I can't wait for August 8th. It's here, pal. We're it's right around the corner. And, um, yes, the hall of famer himself, the pod father is in Russell quest. So isn't no. that crazy, dude, I'm going to go in the wrestling hall of fame and two weeks later, I'm going to be in a video game. Like this is like, <laughs> God, what in the world is going on guys for real. I love this game. I've seen, uh, I haven't I've been fortunate enough to play it yet, but I've seen some trailers and stuff and yeah. we're going to start dripping some of that out on our social. If you haven't already, uh, follow that so you can keep up with it. But maybe what we'll do is we will, uh, we'll do some, we'll figure out how you and I can play each other on this game. We can do it. Cause I would love for, I would love to kick your ass with you. Oh, like you let you be your favorite wrestler, macho man. And I'll be my favorite wrestler, Jeff Jarrett. Okay. And I'm going to crush you with every guitar. Bring it. There's a guitar smash in there. It's a guitar smash. In there. Well, you're damn right. There is. <laughs> uh, and, and we're going to, we're going to make sure that when they do wrestle quest too, that they put me in some Akeem gear and I get to do my finishing move, the foreclosure. Wait, is there a tattoo? Of oh you? yeah, 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 yeah. Did there I is. see that online? Yeah. And, uh, a fellow named John Lopez, who you've met at a bunch of our star cast yes, before. Yeah. Yes. We, we jokingly said on something to wrestle in 2017, Hey, and if you get a tattoo for something to wrestle, you get free, uh, free tickets to our live shows for life. And we had multiple people take us up on it. No, there's you a, didn't. Yeah, man. There's one guy who has an entire back piece. His entire back is the something to wrestle logo. Uh, that, that guy, John got me with an Akeem hat on his knee. It was priceless. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Um, yeah, that. but yeah, well, maybe we'll do that here. If you get a Jeff Jarrett <laughs> tattoo, we'll give you tickets to our live shows for life. we got to figure out what it needs to say or what we need, uh -oh. but yeah, stay tuned. We need some my double J tattoos. Our smash of my word logo. You never know. A whole H O F. Hey, you and I haven't talked about this real quick. We need to mention we're hanging out in a couple of weeks. Did you know that? Oh. AEW is coming to Nashville. Tickets are on sale now. AEWTIX.com. I can't believe that's a real thing, but in August, AEW is going to be in Nashville. Then of course they're going across the pond, going to set all kinds of records at Wembley. See my shirt? Again, the quick drip back to uh, Chicago Starcast, man. It's right around the corner. We got a lot of fun coming up. All right. See my shirt. I usually get swag or my world swag or guitar smash today. I'm wearing the all out London. I've got, uh, it looks like we're still aligning things, but it looks like I'm headed across the pond, do some media, some PR, the buzz is in the air. We're getting into the kind of the go home stretch. Um, what are we just a little over a month out? Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it is, you know, I say this with, Oh boy here. Anyway, it's definitely tracking to sell out. You want to um, have our, our off air discussion on air? No. <laughs> no just so you guys know jeff and i routinely on big shows whether it's wwe aew new right. japan whatever the big show is we will text each other and say how many tickets you think yep and then if it's a big new show 
what do you think the rating is going to be? <laughs> and I'll be damned if you and I, one way or the other, haven't hit it about most of the time. And that's if I know what you do or vice versa. Very eerily close. Eerily close. Mm-hmm. But, Conrad, you know what I thought you was about to throw out there about us hanging out? The Nashville show, we got StarCast a lot coming up. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to be walking in your footsteps again. Little guest speaker out at Podcast Movement. I didn't know if that was, uh, you know, if we're to talk about. I forgot about that. Yeah. So we're going to be doing Podcast Movement together and the live show and StarCast. Uh, Man, we're on the road so much. We're going to have to make sure we're loaded up with Factor. And I know you are because you want to be ready to eat on the go. And listen, here's the thing, guys. This isn't just for professional athletes like Jeff. It's for people who are just trying to make life a little easier. With chef prepared, dietitian approved, ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door, you'll save time, eat good for you stuff, and stay on track with that healthy lifestyle. And by the way, it tastes fantastic. My wife is uh, training heavily right now. Factor is helping fill the gap. And she's got me doing Factor again as well. She didn't have to twist my arm because it tastes great. You see, we're out of our rut. Megan and I have a tendency to fall into a rut where we're doing the same thing. Well, we're doing this week, what we did last week. Well, now, man, this is a life hack for us. Not only is it great tasting, but it saves us so much time. We don't have to go to the grocery store. We don't have to chop. We don't have to prep. We don't have to clean up. These are fresh and over frozen meals that are ready in just two minutes. All you do is if you're watching over on YouTube, you'll see, see that white box. That's just a sheath. You slide that off. And you see your food on the left. It's got plastic across the top, pop a couple of holes in it, drop that dude in the microwave, set it for two minutes and bam, you're ready to go. They got over 34 different weekly flavor packed dietitian approved options. And it's stuff that you don't expect. Broccolini leeks, truffle butter, asparagus, really high quality, quote unquote expensive, but it's not, they found a way to make it affordable. That gourmet plus option is something else, man. I also want to recommend that they've got something for every lifestyle. You try to drop some LBs can't beat calorie smart. It's 550 calories or less. What about protein plus? That's what my man double J is using. He wants at least 30 grams of proteins per serving. And they're making sure they check that box. This isn't just for lunch and dinner. Y'all they got breakfast covered too. You can get uh, bacon and cheddar egg bites. You can get a bacon and egg breakfast skillet. You can get uh, apple cinnamon pancakes. They've even got shakes and smoothies and juices. They've got everything you're looking for. So get factor, enjoy eating well without the hassle. You simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh flavor packed meals delivered right to your door. Seriously. It's ready in two minutes. Y'all. How do you beat that? Not only is it cheaper than takeout and better for you than takeout. It's faster. You can't beat two minutes. No prep, no mess head right now to factormeals.com slash my world 50 and use the code my world 50 to get 50% off. That's my world 50 at factormeals.com slash my world 50 and you'll get 50% off. So let's get to our program today, Jeff. Uh, I can't believe this is real, but we're coming off slam anniversary, which we covered last month. And, uh, we've called this show Houston. We have a problem because that was the tagline for victory road because it's based out of Houston and knowing we're coming to you from Houston, Texas. It makes a lot of sense that we would have Booker T in the main event against Samoa Joe. And the story of Booker and Samoa Joe kicks off coming out of slam anniversary when Booker claims that Kevin Nash was required to take care and save Joe's butt at King of the mountain. And Nash is also going to say that I don't think Samoa Joe can beat Booker. Is this all to build to the main event mafia at this point? Is that sort of the, the theory and the process? Uh, you know, that was a, um, that's a I actually shout out Derek or Conrad or the combination when you guys do show prep and all that good fun stuff. That's a good, that's a good thought process. Was it, or wasn't it? We're talking 15 years ago and we're right. we plant, planting the seeds. And uh, for the timeline folks out there, uh, this is July Conrad. No, yes. It's July pay-per-view and the made of it. Mafia was formed in October with the launch of HD and all that on spike. So I'd like to say 
yes, planting the seeds, but I don't want to go too deep into that because we were coming off same anniversary and that group of guys was, you know, uh, again, it was, it was like it's done in professional wrestling so many times our core I don't want to call it youth movement, but AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, uh, Chris Harris, James Storm, Elix Skipper, uh, uh, other guys in, in the mix, all this that we were bringing, you know, that we were given the push and, and, and getting going Booker, Kevin Nash, Kurt, Scott Steiner, uh, sting, all that group. We wanted to pair them up and, 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 I don't want to say give the rub because at this point, but that, that was the storytelling we were starting to do, but was it a true setup for main event mafia? I don't actually think that we can say, yes, this was, this was a setup. It was just kind of the nature of the beast. And a lot of, a lot of times letting the story write itself. Well, I mean, I like that, you know, that sometimes we just get there organically and, um, one of the things I wanted to ask is if Samoa Joe picks up a win on impact, it's a great match against Frankie Kazarian. And this sort of helps get the story started. And I know we both hold Frankie in high regard. Uh, he's one of, if you ever have a chance to meet him at a live event, go out of your way to do so. One of the nicest guys I've ever met in professional wrestling. And I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to get to know him personally and professionally, just a 10 out of 10 guy. But I heard a great mind in wrestling and I won't say their name, but they once said that, you know, you have your main event and you have your, uh, you have your attraction and then you have the opponent. And it often feels like Frankie would be positioned as the opponent in impact and TNA, but very rarely the attraction. Is that a coin flip? Some, I mean, are some guys doomed because they're quote unquote, so good. Like we know we can put this guy in there with anybody and he'll make them look good. This guy's going to fly all over and bump for everybody. And I almost feel like Dolph Ziggler at times falls into that category where it's like, you know, it's going to be a good segment. You know, he's going to make the match look good. He's going to make this other guy who maybe is hurt or needs a shot in the arm or he's new and, and, and needs the reps. He's going to make that guy look good. So we'll just put him in that spot. It feels like Frankie sort of got cast that way at times in his career as well. Why do you think that was? You you put you took half of the answer directly out of my mouth. Okay. And the first time Conrad I ever heard that was my old man talking about Eddie Marlin, his father in law's tag team partner, Eddie Gilbert's dad, Tommy Gilbert. He would say, and I've heard him say it to his face, Oh, damn, Tommy, you're just too damn good. You can be a heel or a baby face. You can work the main event or the opening match. You're just too good, damn good in the ring. And when you look at so many talent out there. Frankie's not the first, not the last. You just said Dolph. I mean, there, there's, I mean, there's probably five to 10 guys on the AEW roster, five to 10 guys on the WWE roster. It's the nature of the beast of when you look at it. So we knew our top guys, let's just say Joe, AJ, and pick your third, you know, whatever. And then our tag team would be America's most wanted, you know, and I'm talking about coming on the up and comers. And then you just kind of look heels and baby faces. It's really, I don't want to say it's a flip of the coin. It, it, it's, and, and look, I've kind of fallen into that in and out of my career. It, it's, it's when you're can of have a match, the old proverbial saying with a broomstick, it can be a positive, but it can damn sure be a negative. That's just the reality of our industry. Where do you think you fell at what stages of your career? Do you feel like you fell into that? I have um, an opinion, but I want your opinion. Um, I'll, I'll say WWF. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I, th I think it, 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 at WCW, when the flair thing kind of stutter started, I think a lot of times Kevin Sullivan, I know he'd come to me and say, Hey, you'll have a good match with this guy. Go do this. What's your thought? No, I was going to say the, the, the WWE stuff. I mean, but to me, both stints, you know, I mean, I guess the first one was brief enough, but I'm saying when you came back with Austin, that whole era, 97, that yes. feels like you're definitely in that spot. Yes. Uh, but what you said about Kevin Sullivan saying, you'll give this a guy a good match. That's exactly what that is. Like, 
uh, uh, you know, he's, he's got to have some stories, right. But he's also got to fill in some matches around those stories. Yes. And you became one of those matches and sometimes you were the opponent. And I just think that's unfortunate. I mean, I'm glad to see that, you know, Kaz is, is back with impact and he had a heck of a match, um, on pay-per-view towards the end of last year with Josh Alexander that I just absolutely match. I text him. So why do you wait to see that? If you're a Frankie Kazarian fan like Jeff and I are, go watch him and Josh Alexander from last November in Louisville. It's unbelievable. If we're giving Frankie matches, Kurt Angle, Frankie Kazarian, Impact Zone was one of the best TV matches I've ever seen. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. How about that? Well, Jeff, let's talk about Sting, but we'll do that after these words. Hey guys, Tony Schiavone. You need to call a timeout real quick. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling what happened when listeners for a while now about all the cool things happening over on adfreeshows.com. The debut of Tuesday with the Taskmaster is here, exclusively on Adfree Shows. Kevin Sullivan shares stories of his 50 plus years in the business, including the night the business changed forever. The night he turned heel, he stayed at my house. His agent came. I had a three bedroom house at the time on the beach and I wouldn't let the agent have a room. I gave Hulk a room and we didn't leave till the first match was in the ring. We got in his limo and drove down. I was so afraid someone was going to change, change his mind. And I've heard a lot of things that it might have been Sting, it might have been Big V. I didn't have a second choice. It would have to be Hulk. On a new edition of The False Finish, Conrad is joined by none other than Glacier as he breaks down how the Glacier character came to be and the memorable vignettes leading up to his debut. I enjoyed doing the vignettes. Uh, I felt like it was um, a chance for me to show off that martial arts side uh, that I had had, you know, and it was something I was very passionate about. And now, yeah, my two loves of pro wrestling and martial arts were being combined together. So, so I was all in. That's just a small taste of what we've got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. All right, Jeff, so let's talk about Sting. He is uh, He's going to make it known that he's going to be watching the match of Joe versus Booker T. Was the plan to always try to turn Sting heel? Uh, was that a negotiation process with him? I mean, I know he started his career in a heel tag team with the ultimate warrior before they were using those names, but eventually he becomes like the baby face. And I know there was a, a moment in time where we didn't know whose side is he on WCW, the NWO, but by and large, he's been a perennial baby face, but you guys at least had the discussion. What do you remember about that? When you said, was it a negotiation and the first knee jerk reaction would be, oh my gosh, everything's a negotiation. What I've learned through the years, and this is now over 20 years that I've done, not just shared dressing rooms with him, but, but, um, I'm talking about from a business relationship. Well, at WCW, we worked together a lot and you know, the story I met him and all that, but I'm talking about the TNA days when I literally did start into true business negotiations, not a match finish is that what I've found through the years is yes, everything is a negotiation with Sting, but reality is, is that he doesn't knee jerk reaction really on anything. He processes things kind of a lot like you kind of thinks things through, um, not in a hurry. And I tip my cat to it because he always was he always is very protective and I don't say of his character, but just of the decision-making process and trying to think as, as long-term as he, as you possibly can, which, uh, I, I really do. Cause he's not thinking about this match or this TV show or this month. It's really the long game. And so, you know, at this stage of his career, you're right. He was really the icon. He was the face of WCW at this point, he had not gone to WWE. Uh, he had joined our company and licensing deals and everything we've talked about with Stinger uh, that he, you know, helped bring to the table and was a part of. And really, really, at this point, he had been with the brand for many years, several years. 
and switching him heel, I don't want to say wasn't an option, but he wasn't going to stray too far out of the character that he had developed through the years. He could have a different mindset and a different platform and, and, and a couple of tweaks in his character that could head him down that road. But even in the peak of the main event mafia, he wasn't a Scott Steiner, Kevin Nash, Kurt Angle heel. He, he was still Stinger. So, yeah, a lot, lot, lot of thought process went into how this was going to develop. And I'll say this, back to our early comment, these type conversations absolutely led us into the main event mafia. Matt Morgan is going to debut as the biggest push star on American Gladiators. How big of a deal was it for you guys to have him be on the show? I mean, did you see any benefit from that in the long run? You know, Matt is a legitimate, legitimate 6'10", 6'11", 7 footer, very athletic, former basketball player. Um, you know, first couple of times I met him, I scratched him. I just think this is right up Vince McMahon's alley. Athletic guy that, that you know, if his whatever skills that Vince or WWE at the time might have not been happy with, I thought immediately, well, why didn't they cultivate it? Because you can certainly cu cultivate this. Uh, but yeah, to get the opportunity and the reboot of American Gladiators was a big deal in Hollywood. They were really swinging for the fences. For us to get him, uh, he lived in the area. Um, I just thought he could really be a, a, a player for us. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the World X Cup. There's uh, maybe a, a snafu here at a series of TV tapings. A lot of the guys who we thought were going to be here for the matches, they're not here. Not because they no showed, but because the paperwork wasn't done in time. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about this, but can you talk to us about the process of these visas that international talent use to get here? I know some of our listeners would say, well, what's the big deal? Why can't they just book a ticket and come over like, you know, a, a tourist might. Talk to us about visas and, and how that was a challenge here. And maybe who was in charge of that for you guys? So at the end of the day, this is something that Panda out in Dallas through their legal team, um, obviously took on board. They worked with a law firm in Nashville, obviously the big law firm in Dallas. And I think we actually enlisted an immigration specialist, visa specialist, New York based, but it is a, because it gets into tax laws and legalities. It's more than buying a guy a plane ticket. He's coming into this country to work, mm -hmm. uh, earn wages that, that puts everything in a different classification and working with Canada is one set of rules. In, in essence, and then United Kingdom and then Japan and Mexico, it, it, because you're working with different governments and, and processes and passports and in a lot of ways, just kind of government relations. And I'm not saying strain government relations. It's just not as easy yet. So you have to start f filling out all the paperwork. Um, you, you have to, you know, uh, look, I don't want to get down a rabbit hole and talk about Canada specifics because we had so much experience with that, with Team Canada and, and several other Canadians. But, um, and then Mexico, just south, of, you know, right across the border, that was not easy. Uh, but it's, at the end of the day, Conrad, lots and lots of paperwork that doesn't happen overnight because you have to get two governments to basically not cooperate, but, you know, sign-offs. It's a, it's a laborious product process. Talk to me about Sanjay Dutt and Jay Lethal. I mean, they're keeping this story going and you would think we would blow it off at the pay-per-view. We actually finished the story and on an impact instead was the pay-per-view just going to be too crowded because of the world X cup is, do you think it had lost steam? Why did it not finish on a pay-per-view? You'll kind of see as we develop that, you know, it was a story that kept bearing fruit. And I say that very entertaining television that we would get in a room and say, Hey, what happens if we, this, this story probably got extended two or three times. That's the reality of it is that it just kept getting it extended. 
uh, in a good way. And they had great chemistry and all three, when I say all three, Sanjay J and uh, SoCal Val, they just, their characters kept evolving and it was um, something that you could kind of lean into that it's, it's relatable. But then on the other hand, it was so over the top and they're best friends, but they're both vying for the girl's love and trying to one up and then trying to play Johnny cool with each other. And it was, uh, it was interesting, but we kept stretching it out. Well, let's talk about, uh, where we are with, uh, with the Karen story. Kurt has put a bounty out on Karen because she's still associated with AJ styles. And that leads to the beautiful people trying to attack her. And they even put a bag over her head, Jeff. <laughs> and, uh, this is, this is all fun stuff. I'm sure she's having a blast. She's realizing, and everybody else is too, what a great performer she is, but she's also probably got some stuff maybe to be concerned about according to the rumor and innuendo that's written about in the observer. Apparently folks are concerned about Kurt's condition at slam anniversary in the TV tapings. We know he has been pushing it to the limit physically. He's banged up. And, uh, listen, when that happens, a lot of people's demeanor and the way they approach business has to change. Were you concerned that, Hey man, the wheels might be coming off here. I mean, he's your top act. And with Kurt Angle potentially going to be on the sidelines or he's hurt or he's going to need some time off. I mean, using your business brain on the business side of things, this has to be a stressful time now. Well, stressful and not just because of Kurt, just running the business day to day. Yes. During 08, and this is the time frame we're talking about, Conrad, it was it was it was I don't want to say insanity, but so many moving parts and yes, one hour to two business wise, we were getting more and more successful. Um, the drama between, I'll just say between me and Dixie or Dixie and Dallas. And there is drama that went on between Dixie and Dallas and Dean, the CFO trying to play referee and Andy. And I'll just kind of call it the office politics, the regular day-to-day -day talent politics, uh, my home life, you know, it, it was, uh, it was tough, you know, uh, losing my wife in May of 07. And so we're, you know, a, a little over a year, but a year removed. That was, uh, you know, personally, uh, some dark times, but so many different moving parts. But when it came down to Kurt, was I worried, you know, you, you can imagine this, the, the guy that sh probably should know first, I knew last, uh, mm. you know, I, I wasn't concerned. And I also remember having, different conversations with different folks and Conrad, you know, me and these, well, the listeners know my delusional optimism. Mm -hmm. I can remember having conversation with folks and saying, now quit judging Kurt. Yes. You judging him on his past or are you judging him because you really think something? And they just kind of look at me in hindsight. They're looking at me going, you dumbass, you ain't going to listen to a word I say. But I also knew the effort that Kurt would put out. He right. is wired differently. <laughs> I have said it so many times. He's 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 just uh, that high caliber athlete by design is wired differently, and so he didn't mind whether it was the month before that table spots. I mean. Yeah, let's mention that here. Kurt and AJ are going to wrestle in the main event of an impact in a lumberjack match. And AJ is going to set Kurt up on a table and AJ is going to go for a dive. Kurt moves and AJ just crashes and burns through the table. And then angle locks in the ankle lock and gets the win that brings Karen down, but she's taken out by awesome Kong. I mean, we're trying some new stuff. There's different layers to this story, Yep. but at the same time, you know, you have concerns over, you know, your most featured talent, Kurt, but I'm sure from your perspective, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm trying to ask a question here. Where is the line? Where does it end between, Hey, that's none of our business. Like on the one hand, if the guy shows up and, and he's on time and he goes out and he performs, not only performs, but performs better than a large margin of the industry. Like my goodness, what can he do? How can we also be critical and say, well, he should blank, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, you also care about the person. So you don't want him to accidentally hurt himself either. And then you 
bear the brunt of that responsibility or feel responsible. Like maybe I should have, would have, could have done something. What, what is it a tightrope act? Are you thinking about lessons from your father or your grandmother or something like that? Conrad, you nailed a microcosm of where is that line at? Because yeah. as a boss owner, uh, creative head of creative, you, you, it's an, it's a nonstop juggling act. And that, you know, on the one hand, and I can remember Dutch Vince and others, but Hey guys. And you know, this is maybe a Dutch Dutch Mantel comment. Somebody in the room said, Hey, are we worried about Kurt Dutch would say, Hey guys, when he's on our time, is he performing well? Yep. Does he generally have the best match on the cart? Yep. You kind of go, and he goes, is it our responsibility when he gets off our time to, to try to figure things out? And Dutch didn't say coming from a mean spirit is that that goes across the board with every talent. And it, that's coming Dutch from the old school. We're not babysitters, um, you know, we're, we're all that. So, you know, as the business has evolved and we'll call it the wellness program and, and just kind of listening and learning so much more, we'll say about CTE and other things. And, you know, at AEW, the amount of trainers that we have on staff and the preventive maintenance that, that, you know, preventive care we do and all that, but just as times evolve, but it was a juggling act. And, um, ultimately our responsibility is what happens on our clock. If you try to babysit every talent, then all of a sudden you're getting in business that candidly you don't belong in and it can cause problems the other way. But, um, you know, when I was watching, uh, a little bit of this back and, and thinking about the research and all that kind of stuff is the, 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 the Kurt, we'll call it the Kurt Karen. And there were so many different players involved. And now we got awesome Kong involved. There were some really intense, good, good shit, pal. Just, just really good, intense stuff. But in retrospective, what do people remember? Oh, Kurt's a comedy guy. Oh, this was a silly deal. Or, you know, they just remember the little highlights that we tried to throw in there to, I don't want to say to give it realism, but just to kind of give it some levity wh where it wasn't serious all the time. But this particular angle was heavy. It was good. Um, Kong's great. <laughs> it, you know, and the, the fans of Impact that, that dive into this stuff, when you kind of watch the stuff back, it's just – if you go into the moment and don't have in your mindset that this is going to be funny or whatever, take it for what it is. It's compelling stuff. Well, what else is compelling is how hard your ding dong can get with blue chew. I know that's a heck of a transition, but your wife's going to say the same. What in the world got into you? Uh, well, what happened is you were listening to my world, the master of the stroke, the master of the guitar shot. And he told you all about blue chew. Now it has the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. That's right. If you want to get real, real hard without spending a whole lot of cash, man, blue chew can get your ding dong there for free. That's right. Stay tuned. We got a special offer for you. You can try these dudes anytime, day or night. So plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises, maybe call that <clears throat> a run in. Well, the process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And buddy, once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. Come on now. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And we got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code my world at checkout just pay five dollars shipping that's bluechew.com the promo code is my world and you'll receive your first month free visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information and we thank blue chew for sponsoring today's podcast uh let's get back at it here we should also mention that team 3d tomco christian rhino and abyss are all going to be lumberjacks here in this kurt angle aj styles main event uh, was there ever any consideration to adding team 3d to main event mafia? Did you have big discussions about maybe them, maybe them, blah, blah, blah. 
No, uh, the, the, too big a group. Um, their magic, I believe, is truly Bubba and Devon. Yes, I, agree. I, I just think their dynamic in promos and their dynamic in the ring and their chemistry and you know the, their their history. They they work together to me a, as a true tag team unit. Um, on the main event mafia side, you know. The, the number that we landed on was five. And I know sting was that outlier does it, it, you know, it, I think it just put that group over the top, but Kurt and Kevin and Booker and Scott, those guys, all former world heavyweight champions. That was kind of the, 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 the mark to get in the club, uh, if you will. And sting again, being the outlier being, I don't want to call him the tweener, but is it really going to fit? It, where we're do, telling the story and it did it fit in so many different ways but um team 3d was never thought to go in main event mafia let's uh let's talk about tammy sitch we haven't spent any time talking about her here on the program but there's a rumor at the time that you guys are at least talking about bringing her in to potentially play kurt's love interest and somewhere in this era man she had gotten herself in fantastic shape around the same time she went in the hall of fame and she looked like the Sonny of old again. And, you know, you guys were always looking for what can we do to get people talking and bring in a new name and dust off some legend status and, you know, turn up the nostalgia knob. Do you remember having any discussions that Tam with Tammy at any point about coming in? I wish that our research would have elaborated. I don't remember a single conversation, but with that being said, I certainly can see Vince Russo being all over that and probably Dutch to a lesser degree in the creative room. So I'm wondering if those conversations didn't take place, um, because I wasn't in the creative room 24 seven, they had lots of lots and lots and lots of conversations without me, uh, in the room. So, um, I did, I kind of walked that out and played that through thinking, okay, because the, 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 the line was, Sonny come in to be basically Kurt's manager. Yeah. I feel like it's probably going to be, you know, uh, Karen on somebody else's corner and, and, and Sonny across from her. And she does wind up popping up in Oh nine. I think for WWE, I think the hall of fame thing was, uh, 2011, but at some point, no nine, maybe January, she was there. Okay. Uh, in WWE. And so Maybe she had reached out thinking, Hey, maybe this is an opportunity and it just never got to you. Maybe that for sure. Maybe, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, you guys are going to continue to expand internationally. Uh, you're going to do deals in Portugal and in Spain. Um, you know, this is, this is a cool opportunity. I mean, international money is something that we don't talk about a lot, but for a lot of companies, it's like found money. I mean, even today you take a company like mlw and while it might not be on a ton of fans radars here in the states although i do think they do a great job with their television production and it's a slick looking show and you should check it out if you've been sleeping on it but i know they do very well internationally and i don't think the international appetite gets discussed enough but i'm sure there were points where man those international checks had to keep a company the size of tna going right I don't want to say keep it going, but it was some nice gravy, some nice. It was more than mailbox money. I'll say that. Um, and, and look, at this point, our live event schedule, a non-televised live events had not cranked up. It was beginning. But Conrad, when we had our, we'll call them our, our group of stars that were seen on Spike TV every week, um, New Japan and, you know, Kurt, went over for them several times. So from new Japan to independent wrestling across the country, uh, which we really couldn't monetize, but when you got outside and sent three or four or five matches to, uh, Spain or Portugal or the UK there's because we were making money off our international distribution selling, uh, impact and explosion, uh, and our, they called them the pay-per-views were called premium content into all these markets, that revenue just kept going up and kept going up, which was great. But also we had talent, um, uh, you know, that, that Bob Ryder was running point on and 
you know, that line item of uh, basically being a booking agent, and that was kind of the vision that I had from the very, very beginning, that it's hard to get up and run in a fully look at AEW right now. It's, it's, it's challenging because you have all kind of different internal priorities and I get it, you know, collision came along and that kind of flip that the house rules initial vision. And now we're pivoting and looking at getting back on track and running Fridays and Sundays. But in the early days of, of TNA, and I don't want to say now we're year five or six, we certainly had a vision to, uh, Guys, you're on TV around the globe. Let's all go make some money together. We'll get you booked out at your rate. We'll get our 10% on top of that as a booking agency, which is done every all, every day, all day in, in, in the music business. And there were some lucrative deals. At the time, Spain, Portugal, there was another third country that I couldn't think of. They were red hot. And that's what happens in these international markets. All of a sudden, a programmer will take a raw or dynamite, or at this time an impact, and all of a sudden give it a great time slot, and then it just takes off, and then the ratings come, like it always happens with wrestling, and it gets traction, and then then all of a sudden you see the independent promoters that that may promote music or Disney or whatever, and say, "Hey, I'd like to get a wrestling show in here," and then boom, they book a wrestling show, and it sells a lot of tickets real quick, and then that's how businesses are started internationally. Let's talk about uh, something happening on the other channel. They're doing McMahon's millions. This is clearly a marketing ploy and a ratings ploy. The idea is you can win money just by watching the show and Vince will call you live on air and uh, give you a chance to win some of McMahon's millions. And we recently talked about this with Bruce Pritchard over on something to wrestle. He acknowledged how much fun it was when this would go poorly. Because not everyone would answer. Not everyone's phone line was working. Not everyone was watching. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just a lot of missteps here. But Vince is right there on camera having to grin and bear it. But you know grins are not oh, what well. he's thinking on the inside. No. Uh, eventually, though, there is something that happens here that I thought maybe was in poor taste, but maybe it was just planned ahead of time. And when I asked Bruce about it, he was legitimately shocked. He had not heard about it. You may have recalled hearing about this. I don't know that you were watching WWE at the time, but in one of these segments, a piece of the stage falls on McMahon and they act like he's injured here. But when the staging falls and there's an injury, we're just on the heels of a real tragedy on the TNA side of things. Bruce was totally caught off guard when I asked about the timing of that. And he said, honestly, and I believe him, he had no idea that there was a tragedy and unfortunately a casualty at a TNA pay-per-view event, which we recently covered. When you heard of this, did you think, man, how poor taste can you get? Or did you know this is just bad timing? It wasn't on their radar. The millions concept. I briefly, you know, what kind of junk I am Conrad. Yes. And over the last couple of years, um, me and Karen have now kind of this, I, I don't know, it's a joke, but it's a running deal is Conrad. I don't have any real recollection of what you just went through with McMahon's millions and the fallen and the paralysis. But when I look at, Oh, eight, okay. I just kind of went through, I had everything going on in my life. It was on Monday nights. If I wasn't in Orlando and I was at home, we were having creative meetings. And I re remember we would do Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesday for creative. Every now and then we'd stretch it to Thursday, but essentially Monday and Tuesday were our, our long days. So I didn't watch Raw hardly ever. It was, uh, remember this word, TiVo, you know, so I didn't get to watch it every week. Uh, but no, I don't really have any recollection of the an angle, and I certainly don't have recollection of the paralysis at all. It's uh it's a shame that it happened. Uh, we're going to chalk it up to bad timing. Uh, Bobby Lashley is out of WWE fresh off of a hell of a run, including being a part of the most talked about match, uh, at WrestleMania that year from a mainstream perspective. Uh, but now he's going to say, Hey, I'm doing MMA. And according to the observer, there's at least discussions about him doing something with TNA. We know eventually 
he does wind up working for impact. Did you have any of these early conversations with Bobby Lashley? What was your impression of him? So if you look over, there's a video or a picture on our video feed of, of Bobby posing and right behind him is Bellator, which is also by, you know, Viacom owned. Um, and so that is kind of where all the initial discussions, Hey, Bobby's fighting over here on our Bellator brand. I don't want to say that they ask of any interest, but when we kind of, kind of saw, Oh, I hate to use this word. I guess it's such a four letter word. Now the synergy that, Hey, our schedule isn't full time. And I think he had a, I think his first deal was a three fight. Deal. Not, not a lot. We knew there was going to be a possibility of us working together. And like you said, um, when we kind of dug, I look, Bobby looks phenomenal. And when you kind of, but I can remember that's the highest grossing pay-per-view of all time. Is that, I don't think I don't think it was. I mean, it was up there though. A head shaving deal, isn't that right? Yeah, there? Battle of the billionaires. Yeah, but anyway, I just like why did he let? Why, why did he leave up there? Why did they let him go? But yeah, we were def all of us were definitely interested. And Dixie, that was one of her. I don't say pet projects, but she kind of dove into the the spike side of it. And said how how can we work together? Because he was a going to be great to get a great talent, but b collaborating with the network was always a bonus for everyone to be clear that wrestlemania we're talking about that set all the records that was in 07 here we are in 08 wow. and he's out so it, it would certainly be a feather in the cap if you can get him it's also reported in the observer that you're going to change the taping schedule instead of it being monday and tuesday now it's going to be tuesday and wednesday and i guess this is to help with the creative process is this a more costly move as well is it cheaper to fly in on certain days or hotels cheaper on certain days. Does any of that play a factor? I wish I could remember like the deciding factor. Um, once a month, we obviously did our pay-per-views there. And, um, at this time we took them on the road. So a Sunday pay-per-view, you don't have to go to, I mean, no, we didn't have, at this point, we didn't have the luxury of going to bed in Orlando. So on Mondays, we had to create a travel day. I think we tried it once or twice. Follow me, Conrad. We were doing a pay-per-view on Sunday and then flying into Orlando and shooting, going directly shooting TV. That, that wasn't optimal. Guys were tired, you know, all, all that. So to do a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday wasn't the best case scenario. So we kind of said, all right, let's readjust. If we're taking our pay-per-views on the road, let's go Tuesday, Wednesday taping schedule. Orlando didn't really care. But here's kind of the flip side of it. If we shoot a show on Monday, that means in Nashville post-production and, oh, Kevin Sullivan will probably uh, be able to get the, the real deep dive instead of Monday to Thursday to air, then he had Tuesday to Thursday air. So we took a complete day of post-production out, which is a tighter turn, which can be done. But a lot of factors involved in making those kind of decisions. But I think the reason that we altered the, I think, the, the, the top reason was we had to create a travel day in between pay-per-views and taping. Let's, uh, let's also talk about your new travel. You're going to be doing a UK tour. It's a success. Pretty much every arena is sold out. You're selling between 1600 and 3000 tickets. And you're also announcing that Manchester, Birmingham, Glasgow, and Wembley are all going to be booked. Some of those are buildings that can hold over 10,000 folks. And you're bringing some of that same moxie here stateside. You're setting up Corpus Christi in Laredo for 8,000 tickets and 9,500 tickets. Uh, were you guys thinking, hey, we got the mojo? Or, or is there a paradigm shift? Like, why the, the, the desire to book the bigger buildings here? Let's talk UK. Because the other two is, it's, it's more or less the same thing. But in the UK, we'll call them. Okay, you got A and B markets, uh, London being the A. You know, there's three, there's only really three, eight, four. I'm forgetting a few, but in the United Kingdom. But, you know, A and we'll call them the, the top markets. Our strategy to win, to go in the very first tour, which was a very sound strategy, very successful, was to go into to the C and D markets. Just like you said, 1,500 to 3,000 seat size arenas figure out the demand for the product go where wrestling isn't uh wwe doesn't go to c and d markets so so kind of go off the beaten path of where wwe goes and look the folks from london and 
Birmingham and Glasgow and, and Manchester, they'll travel uh, if they want to see it. Let's just see where we're at, where we went in, sold out, and the ticket sales going in, I mean, our advances were great. I don't know if any of them sold out in advance, but they were close. And so the promoters are the ones that, they basically are the ones that said, hey, for us to really make a, m a lot of money, we got to go up. Okay, hey, Manchester seats 12,000. That doesn't matter. We do it all the time. We'll cut the venue in half. We'll scale it for 6,000. That's still done today every week. Uh, I mean, you know, WWE's red hot and AEW, you know, in times, they that's what happens. You scale buildings. You close off the top balcony or however it may be. But the promoters immediately said, look, we want in this for the long haul. You're, you know, the most you can come over here is twice a year at the very most. So we got to make as much money as we possibly can. And there is no middle ground. There's not like a 6,000, 7,000 seat arena. They wanted to go up. Um, and it was their business model. And we leaned into it and we got our, you know, our guaranteed was, okay, here's the business structure. Conrad, we got a guarantee plus a back end. So did we really care how they went? If this is what they wanted to do so they could make the most money, they, we knew that they're incentivized. If they make a lot of money, we're going to make even more. We also see uh, LAX defeat James Storm and Robert Roode on Impact, but Storm and Roode get their revenge afterwards and beat the hell out of them with some belts. So we got some whippings going on here. Uh, unfortunately, Scott Steiner is going to tear his ACL when he's on the road. He's going to be on the shelf for mm -hmm. quite a bit. And I don't know that anybody had to be more disappointed than Petey Williams. It felt like he was getting uh, some, some camera time and a renewed push here pairing with uh, Scott Steiner. How devastating is this to Petey's screen time when Scotty goes down? You know, we always have what ifs, Conrad. If yes. Petey Pump and uh, Big Papa Pump would have got to run its course, where would that have taken us? But it derailed it. I mean, tough luck for Petey and damn sure tough luck for Scott with the injury. But um, bad timing. And it, it certainly, you know, you just had to, that's one of those things that you always got to be prepared to adjust for injuries. And, we certainly had to do that because Scott, um, yep. ACL tear. Uh, Frank Trigg is going to make the observer. They're saying that he's getting serious and he's down training in Orlando every chance he gets. Uh, I know that we got to see the one-off, but was there ever any serious consideration you think to Frank making a full go at this? I don't think even in Frank's mind, a full go, he had his career. I think he, you know, would have tried it. Um, when I read that, I didn't know that he ever really trained full time. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Uh, I'm not saying that the sheets are, are, uh, inaccurate, but I don't remember that. I don't recall that. Or I wasn't told that. I don't believe Chantel Taylor is going to debut and defeat Kong as a fan from ringside. She wins the knockouts title. And it's said that you're high on her. Uh, we know her as Taylor wild. Talk to us a bit about why you were high on her. I mean, all these years later, you know, even now I'm saying she's 37. So 15 years ago, my girl was 22 years old. Yes. I mean, you talk about young and what a moment here. Uh, what do you remember about this? The, the simplistic thing that I believe captured the TNA audience in such a positive way is when you looked at the knockouts roster, nobody was the same. I mean, right. The beautiful people, awesome Kong, ODB, Raisha Said, uh, Roxy. I mean, we could go down the list. We didn't have, you know, if you're talking Ricky Morton language, that white meat baby face, the mm -hmm. all American boy. She was the all American girl, you know, even down to the red, white, and blue outfit. But she had, obviously, she was young. God, I didn't realize she's only 22, but had the youthful appearance and had an incredible crazy amount of fire the energy in her i'll say that and so she fit nicely into the knockouts division let's uh let's talk about the full metal mayhem match it's announced where rhino is going to challenge team 3d and kirk to face him christian and aj all these years later do you remember who came up with the name full metal mayhem
it could be the guy that's the super producer for Boogs. Maybe. Oh, okay. It might be a miss. I, for, for whatever reason, you know what? He'll know because it, oh, yeah. it, it, I mean, he, he, well, I think he'll know, but it's one of those things that I was big on. Hey, and Rudy was great about it. Rudy would say, Hey, uh, team, I hate to be the bear of bad news, but for the third consecutive creative session, uh, the marketing or Dixie or maybe even spike or whatever it may be. Hey, can we relook at October, November, and December pay-per-view names or whatever, whatever needed to be branded or named or whatever it may be. Uh, cause I was always of the mindset and me and Dixie had healthy conversations like that. I said, let us start it in the creative room. Cause we're going to have to create shows out of this and look, marketing can tweak it, but it's, it's one of those things as far as name of matches and look, um, full metal mayhem is our version of TLC, right? I'm trying to, uh, they get, yeah. get run together. okay. You can't call it TLC. So right. let's call it something different that kind of fits and, and sells the match. And that's where our mindset was. And I'm sure just like WWE does it to this day, I've, I've seen a whole Bible of a 50, 60 page document of different match types. And it's, they're not the first to create it. We had one, all that, but anyway, full metal mayhem. Uh, I don't know exactly who came up with that, but it was a, a, a group team effort that we probably all said, yeah, let's go with that name. So let's talk about something that Dave Meltzer writes here. And I know this is going to get you on your soapbox. Oh uh, boy. And I'm excited for you to be on your soapbox. Uh, but before we do, we need to talk about your wiener meat and how manscaped it is boys and girls. I love bragging about manscaped. It's time to unleash the beast within you. And this summer manscaped is here to help you level up your beach game with the new beard hedger pro kit. They're going past the waist deep in the grooming game. No, nope, they're jumping in head first. We're going to go ahead and get you this beard pro, this beard hedger pro kit. It's a game changer. Y'all it's going to let you shape your beard like a true beach babe. So let those beach balls bounce and turn heads all over the place by visiting manscaped.com and using the code my world for 20% off with free shipping. Now this beard hedger pro kit is something you got to see to believe man. You've got 20 different hair cutting links on this beard hedger pro. Think about that. It's a quarter. It's a rotary trimmer. That's cordless, but it's doesn't have these 20 different guards. You know, we've all got like junk just lined up, right? Drawers full, not here, not with manscaped 20 links with one guard. That sounds too good to be true, but. This titanium coated T blade is the real deal, man. It's tough on hair, but it's smooth on your face. It's going to give you single stroke efficiency. It's also waterproof. So you can use it in the shower. You don't have to uh, clog up your sink. There's also an all in one beard shampoo and conditioner. Remember the face uh, hair is different than the head hair. This is designed specifically to help you moisturize and reduce those ingrown hairs and promote beard health. How about the beard oil that'll relieve dryness on both on the beard and the skin beneath, give you a little shimmer and shine on that skin too. How about the beard balm that'll let you shape style and moisturize and tame for that sculpted sculpted look. You also get three free gifts along with this. You got the beard brush, the comb and the scissors to ensure that your beard is ready to impress. So get 20% off plus free shipping with the code my world at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Be sure to use the code my world manscaped beard hedger, one stroke, one guard, 20 lengths. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. Uh, let's jump back in here and let's talk a little bit about, uh, the note in the observer that I know is going to fire you up. I'm just going to read it to you and then we'll break it down. Quote, Jeff Jarrett is being advertised for the next UK tour in January. As noted here many times, Jarrett coming back has always been in the plans. They just didn't want to waste it at a point where it wouldn't have maximum value. Well, that's the PC way of putting it. Jarrett didn't want to be wrestling and not either with the belt or in the mix for the belt and end up like Christian or someone like that. When Angle had his run and wasn't going to lose it, he wasn't coming back to just be a victim of the month, which quite frankly is smart business. 
since it had been long planned for Joe to get the belt and have a long run by January with the angle with Karen angle and Kurt angle away from the title picture, things open up better for Jarrett. Although at this point, I don't know of a start date back. This is just speculation. So probably wrong, but I could see him coming back in at the unannounced return of bound for glory in October, where they're determined to make that a WrestleMania like card with lots of things coming out of it. I don't see him in a match on that show, but it is possible. So listen, there's lots to break down there. Clearly you see a little bit of hater aid from him saying, oh no, he just didn't want to be there if he wasn't in the mix for the belt. Now the implication from Dave, who I like and consider a friend is that you remark for yourself and that I'm not coming back unless I get to be the champion. I would say, well, that's a little silly. I don't think that's how Jeff operates. I would say, yeah, why well, come back when business doesn't need it? We bring him back when we need it. We don't bring him back just to have a spot on the card. That doesn't make sense. And since you're still there working, it's not like you're sitting at home meeting bonbons. You work at every show. You're just not on camera every show. I just don't see how this is much of a story, but I wonder when word like this gets back to you, how you receive that type of story. I'm not getting on my soapbox, Conrad. Okay, now, good. Just let me ask you a couple of questions as we get into this. Let's go back. Marcus, can we go back to a two box? I just kind of want to see my partner's face on this. Just a little Q&A here. Okay. So can you just briefly, when did you take a lapse in wrestling? Uh, I quit watching in, uh, most recently in January of 2006. And I got back in, I, I saw the, the CM Punk promo for 2011, the day after, but it wasn't until but my, so early, many, early, but, early 13. Yeah. But nineties you watched, right? Yeah. 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 Would you say. And I'm not saying like you're going to get a razor blade or a switchblade and cut me, but did I have heat with you? In the oh, I, yeah. Human fast forward button hated your guts. So there's this little fat doughboy kid named Paul Walter Hauser that when we met, he had to let me know, you know, Jeff Jarrett, I hated your stinking guts. And I said, well, later on tonight, I'm going to give you another reason. So that's one. Conrad's and you know, Conrad's one, Paul Walter Hauser. Uh, look, we could go down a, a list of folks that would say, Jeff, I hate your stinking guts. I, I detest you. I despise you. You no good, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Why would Dave Meltzer be any different? He's not. He, I had heat with Dave. I've had well, he, Dave since 1986, 87, 88. Oh, he's the promoter's kid. Oh, like, he is. Oh, he's that. Oh, heat, 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 heat. I've just come to realize, and I'm not on a soapbox. I just come to realize Dave is no different than anybody else. You are definitely top three businessman I've ever met in my life. So you, your IQ is not just above average. It's way above average. I'd say Dave Meltzer has made a fortune off of writing 60,000 page newsletters. So I think his IQ is up there as well. That has nothing to do whether old double J resonated and said, I want to speak the shit out of Jared. He's a piece of, okay. So I had heat with Dave. It's that simple. It's just, it's a little silly to me though, that it's like, why would anyone's return? Like let's, I, let's it, change the name. Dave backhanded me compliment. It's really smart business in yes. his own words. Yes. I couldn't yeah. wait for you to re bring this up today. I cracked up in his own words, a, a dig, but it's smart business. You know, here's what I think is interesting. I think sometimes Dave vacillates his POV, meaning are we hearing from Dave from the perspective of the boys or the office? Because that divide has existed in my mortgage life processors think the loan originators don't do anything. Yeah. Here we go. I love Writers it. think the processors don't do anything. So everybody is like, well, I'm doing all the work. You're not doing anything, that sort of thing. And so I know that that exists inside the confines of the wrestling business. It's 
Hey, if there's a problem with the boys, we settle it here. We don't let the office, don't let them see. So there is this boys in office thing. And so when we see something like this written, I sometimes see things from Dave where I'm like, okay, he's writing that from the company perspective that this was bad. And here's why. And other times I'll see him write things. And I think, okay, he's siding with the boys on this one. So he's not just one way or the other, but I think when he writes, Hey, it's smart business for him not to come back and be just another guy. If you were a traditional wrestler, not someone who's wearing both hats. Yes, that would be very, very smart. But I think it's like on the one hand where he's giving you a dig as the, the one of the boys for not wanting to just come be one of the guys happy to have a spot on the show. He also is, is saying that as a smart, like as the owner, well, that is smart business. Don't just waste it. You need something in your back pocket. And so you are really a unique character that I don't think has really existed outside of dusty roads. Like if you go back and you take a look at the way Dave wrote about dusty, he would be critical of, Oh, dusty put himself in the main event of the second clash of the champions. And how dare he, he's way past his prime. He's too heavy. He's not good anymore. And then he would write. Boy, Dusty got the loudest pop and the biggest superstar <laughs> match of anybody on the show. As he should, he's a legend in Florida. Well, fuck, which one is it? <laughs> like, does he deserve to be there or not? But I think it's because Dave didn't know. Well, he's neither fish nor foul. He's not one or the other. He's both. What do I say? And so I think, you know, you're a unique property in that regard. I think it's probably just you and Dusty. Now I know that Dusty didn't have ownership, but he was certainly the booker, but more often than not, the guy who's performing in front of the camera is not also the guy running the show behind the scenes. He probably didn't know how to handle an animal like double J. That's funny. A great analogy. Great kind of insight into uncle Dave, because that does, it makes, it makes a ton of sense, but there has, uh, and I'm going to give you all the credit. Hey, Jeff, come do this podcast. They need to hear the story. They yeah. Need to hear your story. Conrad, they don't want to hear that. No, I'm telling you, just the conversation we had when you ate seven course meal at a meal. <laughs> they need to hear this story. Conrad, that, no, no. Anyway, but the, I've, I've seen this a couple of different times because me coming back, and I'm tying this back into, when I tell you there was never – a real thought, hey, let's get Jeff back in the title picture. Nope. The reality was we signed Kurt, and he's your centerpiece. Now, a lot of things can go on around him. Samoa Joe and Sting and, I mean, whoever the different type times of the title was. When I was coming back, the thought was because of this is year six, seven, eight, it was that founder, I'll call it, and we never really have called it this on my world. I know Vince Russo wrote it this way. The founder character. You started it, blood, sweat, and tears, got it up and going. You want it to be as successful as possible. Sometimes you actually have to step back in the ring to fight for what's right. But that was kind of the mindset of what is my character going to be when I re-enter kind of, the world of TNA impact wrestling. That was, that, that was, that was, that was my character. It wasn't six time world heavyweight champion trying to get the seventh title that, that go around that, that just wasn't the character. So that's the answer about the belt, but I was doing the juggling act and this is, it's not inside baseball anymore is, is that yes, I want to do what's best for the show, but also Okay, how's how's Dallas going to use this? Um, truly, how's Dixie going to view this? How, how how it's it's you know we we got up rocking and rolling and we're having all these creative discussions and success and impact from one hour to two hours. Now you're going to throw me in there as a talent in these conversations that we hadn't had for a year, year and a half, two years ever since Sting beat me and I went away. So that was in. October of 06, Conrad, and now we're July of 08. So I had been out of the ring two years. Uh, so the conversation was going to be different, but uh, yeah, the timing was what we all wanted. Bring me back from a character when, when it would mean the most. 
Let's switch gears. Let's talk about Mexico. We've spent a lot of time talking about AAA. We haven't spent very much time talking about CMLL. Uh, Meltzer would write to keep up TNAs into the deal with CMLL. They agreed to send AJ Styles, Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and others for one show. How was it dealing with CMLL compared to AAA back here? It, okay. So, and people are, you know, our, our weekly listeners and people diving in and out. We were obviously had the relationship with AAA from day one at TNA with Antonio Pena. This is during a time when tri- AAA and TNA went their separate ways, but we all wanted a relationship in uh, with a Mexican promotion. And so at this time we were working with CMLL, but the communication with that office was incredibly difficult. And today I'll give old Mike, professor Mike today so much credit because he's like, I'm going to give you a heads up. They're not the easiest, no disrespect. They're not the easiest office to work with. What do you mean? Well, they'll go dark on you and not for a couple of days before a couple of weeks. And that turned out to be the situation, but we were doing a talent exchange and bringing their talent up. And we were wanting luchadors on our show specifically. I think it rounds out or they're great additions to the X division, but we had to reciprocate send talent down there. And, you know, it it wasn't always easiest to figure that out, but we got there. It wasn't a perfect set of circumstances either way, but we finally got there. Let's, uh, let's talk about, there's an angle. Uh, and building towards full metal mayhem where team 3d puts Christian through a glass table. And when you think of glass tables, you think of guys like Moxley, not necessarily Christian. Uh, I assume this is working glass. What can you tell us about this? This feels risky. Damn. That's a hell of a shot. Folks go to the YouTube channel. What a hell of a shot that is. And let me ask you one question. Do you think in a million years, Christian Cage would go through a shoot glass table. Well, I sure as hell would hope not. (laughs) No, Um, no, that was, uh, what do you call that? It's a sugar glass, safe glass. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Moose, who we know is uh, Mickey knuckles on the Indies. We talked about her before she is going to be uh, receiving some very bad news. Hmm. I can't believe this is a real sentence, but she broke her femur in a match with Sarah Del Rey for IWA Mid South. Here's somebody who's yeah. new to your company. She's probably not making a ton of money. She's still working indies on the weekend. She has a passion for this, and unfortunately, while she's in the middle of a television program with you guys, she gets hurt pretty doggone bad. When we touched on her before, I don't think you remember exactly who she was, but now that I'm reminding you, oh yeah, she broke her freaking femur. Femur. Sure you remember that. I mean, the yeah. femur is 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 the biggest, strongest bone in your body. It's not a, a bone you hear guys, yeah. Oh, I hurt my ankle, I hurt my knee, I hurt my shoulder, I hurt your femur? femur. What do you remember about this? That, that it just what we've just hit on. How the hell do you break a femur? Right. It was a you know, not a good set of circumstances um and her health was obviously you know the, the most concern but the, the everyone i mean conrad you're like we're having the same reaction 15 years later that everybody had how do you break a femur you almost never hear that unless maybe a car wreck or something like that but yeah um it just i mean tough luck man this is that's the second injury we've talked about on this show steiner's acl and her femur uh, unfortunately, somebody else is going to be packing up tent and this time it's our old pal, Scott Demore. He's going to be leaving the company at the end of the month. Uh, he is, his real life business needs more attention. Obviously we're happy that his, uh, his outside of the ring stuff is doing so well, but he was a real asset for you guys, but, uh, he's on his way out here. What do you remember about him taking a little break here in 2008? A man that wore many, many hats, uh, I don't say from day one, but it went back almost. He's an OG. He's certainly an uh, asylum. And um, I got to think this timeline, Conrad. So forgive me if I make I believe his father's health took a turn for the worse. He had mm-hmm. to go home and take care of personal a- a- and professional thing. His father's a, what was a, you know, multiple businesses. 
in in, in Windsor, uh, which is right across from Detroit in in Canada. real estate developer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and Scott had to go take care of home, so there was no eat, brother. No, there was okay. We totally understand. We wish you well. Wish you nothing but the best. You're always welcome. Come back. Um, but we understood that he had to go take care of family business. Let's talk about Jim Mitchell. He is going to be uh, out of the company, but allegedly this is a company decision. Were you guys out of ideas for Jim or was there something else? I was hoping that I could remember the abyss because he was always, you know, the, the new church abyss. Th those were kind of his, his, his guys. And I'm just wondering during this era, you know, abyss given a rest, whatever it may be, but you know, father Jim, it's not like he ever, he didn't do anything to like, oh, he's out of here. That was not the case. I believe it was a creative decision that our, you know, he didn't have, we didn't have any talent for him to manage. There's lots of criticism uh, and finger pointing going on in the observer where people are saying that there's major political behind the scenes struggles going on where people are living and dying by the weekly ratings. And because the numbers are struggling, they're trying to point fingers and create scapegoats. So now people are pointing to like Kurt Angle, who was on top when we were enjoying maybe our highest peak of success so far. And now he's being booked like a more comedic character and not in the main event, but the middle of the card and ratings are down. And they're also saying they're down because we haven't gotten a hundred percent behind Joe the way we have with Kurt in the past. And maybe we don't have a really strong heel in Kevin Nash because he's been allowed to be quote unquote, too cool. So there's lots of criticism going around. And I know that you have been really loud and proud on this. And I wanted to mention this to you, Jeff. I ran into multiple people in Waterloo this past weekend who told me they were mad at me and they hated me and they had heat with me because I found a way to make you likable and they like you. <laughs> and I had at least two people say, Rhett, all creative is subjective has changed the way they view wrestling. So instead of getting upset about it, they just say, Oh, well, that segment wasn't for me. And they're able to move on with their lives. So I appreciate that you have a healthy approach, but it is written about in the observer as if, and there's some debate and some finger pointing. So let's just talk about what the ratings were doing on June 12th. We had 1.3 million viewers on June 19th. We had 1.4 million viewers. On June 26th, we had 1.2 million viewers. On July 3rd, we had 1.4 million viewers. That sounds pretty damn stable to me. You know, this doesn't feel like a panic button type deal. Was there too much emphasis at times in these strategy sessions? I know you're monitoring ratings and I know you're trying to pay attention to who are the people watching. Let's give them more of what they like and less of what they don't. I get that. But at the same time, there's almost no difference between these ratings, Jeff. Like, what are we arguing about? What was going on? So let me ask you, Conrad. I'm not saying in the last couple of years, but let's just go back maybe 10 years. Have you ever found yourself going into the office and maybe talking to the processors and all of a sudden you literally hear not one gripe, two gripe, three gripes, and then that fourth one, you start to think, hmm. Jeez, we may have a problem with this MLO. Yes. Let me go over here. I'm going to talk to this one and this one and this one. And you go, what the hell? We've got serious, serious issues here. And then you take a step back. All right, Conrad, that's a perfect example of the TNA office. Did you hear about ratings? They're down. Oh, it's, it's, it's a Nash issue. No, it's a Joe issue. Get to TV. The talent are talking. Well, if Kurt Angle, the Olympic gold medalist, wouldn't be in so many damn comedy, did you see Kurt? He was pissed off. He's pissed off because he couldn't go work out. Had nothing to do. I mean, it's just like a sewing circuit. It's one thing led to another. Conrad, I would get sucked into those things from time to time and think, Jesus, what are our, you know, let's take a look at this, guys. Let's look at our segments. And is it a Nash deal? Is it a Samoa Joe? Is it comedy? Is it not enough wrestling? Is it too much? I'll go through the whole thing. And then I would go, you know what? Let me call Kevin K at Spike. Let me just blow in a call to him and come up with something that I'm talking about marketing and just kind of go into it. 
and you call up and his assistant says, yeah, he, he, he said that, uh, you'd be calling. He got an email. Let me get him. Kevin K. Hey Jeff, how you doing? Great, Kevin. How are you doing? He'd go, well, it's June. You know how that is in the business TV business. And you just go, Oh, okay. Everything's down. His network's down. So for us to be doing that steady stuff, I don't remember Spike ever be go, ever saying, God almighty guys, I'm worried about y'all's ratings. Cause we were one of their top two or three shows every week. Just like when you look at everybody living and dying by AEW, uh, it comes out number three show, number five show, number one show. Oh my God, this week they're down to the number six show. Big deal. <laughs> it's still a top rated show 52 weeks a year. So the yeah. thing that gets me, Jeff, on the current AEW stuff is whenever, you know, they come out that they're the number one show and let's say it's 900,000. The WWE tribalists just, I don't even think it's necessarily tribalists. People just like to argue. They yep. just like to be right. You know, they, they want to, yep. ha, ha, you know, I, I have, I want to, I want to be an antagonist. I want to take a part, a different view. I get that. But my God, when they're like, yeah, it may have been the number one show, but still less than a million people watched it. So Did like you- if the network's happy, I mean, it, it, context is the key to life. Eric Bischoff always says it on, on our show, 83 weeks context is King. If you're number one, I mean, now listen, I'll admit I was educated here in Alabama, but I don't know how much higher they go than number one. Like to me, number one, like they list all the other shows and they were below them. Right. Yeah. So they're the best. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. Well, and we were number one on spike and I'd love to sit here and tell you, well, <sighs> Even in our down month, Conrad, in TNA, we did one point million viewers. You don't see that now, do you, pal? I mean, I'd love to stick my chest out. The reality is, in these days, Spike was in, let's just say, 88 to 93 million homes, so, so, whatever it is, mid-80s to low-90s, whatever it was in that era. Now, 73, 75 They've lost 20 million homes to cord cutters. Oh, let's go over and look at this YouTube page. That segment got 600,000 views in the last 24 hours. Oh, yeah, but a third of that's India. Okay, 400. What what are we talking about, guys? Wrestling is killing it across the board in content creation, A, and content content views. It's, It's killing it. Here's the thing I want us to do better with as a community. Oh, I want to hear this. If you like wrestling, like if you really like wrestling and let's be clear, if you're jumping on an app called X and talking about wrestling, you really like wrestling. I run into people in my everyday life. Just casually. I'll be sitting at the the bar counter at the boot. And on a Monday night or a Wednesday night or a Friday night wrestling will be on. And someone at the bar will start talking about, oh man, I hadn't seen this in years. That's a casual wrestling fan. My man ain't got a strong opinion about the, what the ratings were of that show. He ain't going to talk in and chime in about it the next day. So my point is, if you're going on social media and talking about wrestling, you're a wrestling fan. Why are you rooting against wrestling? (laughs) Like. If I love something, why do I talk trash about it all the time? Like, you know, we talk about toxic fan bases. I thought for a long time, Alabama had toxic fan base. Like I'll never forget after Saban had won like his second national championship for Alabama. If we lost a game or had a bad drive or whatever, I would see and hear people who were season ticket holders in tickets around me. Nick Saban's got to be fired. (laughs) And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? He just won two national titles even before that. Like, I don't understand how these armchair quarterbacks and fans exist and I get it, but I'm saying this is supposed to be fun. And if you really love this thing, why would you want to pull against it? Like, I understand you might say, well, I didn't like that show. Okay. Would wrestling be better served if that show went away? Would this thing you say you love be better served if less people were interested in becoming professional wrestlers? because it was impossible to make a living. 
isn't it better for the industry and the things you enjoy? Do you have a better chance of enjoying it in the future? If more people are trying to actively get in that business, if more people are actively trying to watch that business, do you think they'll create more merch and more shows? Or do you think that this shit just exists in a vacuum and some sucker billionaire is just going to drop out of the sky and start writing checks? That's not reality. That's not the way it works. These are real businesses that are making money and are trying to gauge the audience. And if you're constantly voting, but it's only with a negative vote, shut the fuck up. <laughs> you're hurting wrestling. Like, uh, if you really like this, you should pull for it. Right, Jeff? Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, so much about life is this simple. Grow up. Yeah. Little kids complain when they run out of ice cream. Wait, you just ate a half a pint. Yeah, but I wanted more. Oh, guess what? Just be grateful that you had ice cream today. Oh, I mean, you know, it's. Oh, Conrad. I'm just saying, I know you and I are mutually aligned on this. I want MLW to set an attendance record at their next show. I want Triple Mania to sell more pay-per-views than they ever have for the next Triple Mania. Yes, I hope for certain that Impact sets a record at every live event they go to for the rest of the year. I hope WWE can't, can't has to cut all comps off. I hope <laughs> every show is at full capacity. Yeah, there you I go. Hope Wembley Stadium, that they have to get an overflow venue next door to it for eight, that's good for the industry. Oh, like, I, don't, the <laughs> I don't understand how people uh, are negative. Like this is, if you really like this thing, you should want people to, who are in it to make more money. You should want more people to want to be in it. You should want there to be more places to create more jobs for people to work. Said differently, if this was another industry, man, I hope they shut down restaurants. I went to a bad one last night and I hope they just shut them all down. For sure. And you know, on the way to the uh, Atlanta last week, Jeff, we swung through a McDonald's. They gave us the wrong order. I hope they all go out of business. <laughs> My life would be better if there was no more McDonald's. I'm going to get on social media and start. What is wrong? <laughs> What's going on, Jeff? It happened. People got brain worms. It, it ha dude. It happened. But I also think it's it's sports. Yes, you, you talk about your Saban fans. There's something about professional wrestling that emotional connection people live vicariously through characters and then they become their own character and i hate jeff i don't like yeah whatever they loved it. it's just human nature it, it's literally that's why professional wrestling it at the end of the day they're the greatest fans on earth i i, I have always said that once i've really tried to, to, to think things through. And I'm talking about, Oh, I totally agree. There's no better fan base, but I, I do think that the, life they, would be a lot easier for them. Jeff, they would enjoy it more if they just watch the show, record the show. Hey, listen, don't hate watch damn DVR it fast forward and watch the stuff you like. And if it's something you don't like, hit fast forward. Uh, I did on Jeff a lot when I was a kid. That's right. But, but the, the, uh, seriously, like why, why are you hate watching stuff? I don't get it. Or rooting against it. Man, this company's ratings are down. Yay. Let's say that differently. I want people to lose their jobs. Yay. <laughs> you're, you're a turd human. Well, why would you vote for that? Oh, Conrad, it's uh, human nature. It's I just think it's so much. E and by the way, let me just say this. If all that comes out of your mouth is negative, people don't want to be around you. I, I was going to say, they're, I mean, they're, they're unhappy. They're unhappy, but I'm just saying no one wants to. Nobody says, man, I can't wait to see this guy. He's so negative. He just drains me every time. What? Nope. That's, add, that's a bingo right there. Try to add value. How about that? And speaking of adding value, we added a bunch to this show. 73.7% .7 thumbs up for victory road. 2008. We had 3000 fans. That's probably considered a, a little light considering Houston is a big wrestling city and Booker T's the hometown boy. Uh, 3000 tickets though. That ain't a bad house. Do you remember being disappointed in it? We were hoping for a little more. I think we were hoping just because I remember the kind of the projections and going to the different markets and taking pay-per-views on the road, but 3000 paid wasn't exactly the end of the day for us. It, yes, we wanted more, but it wasn't like this absolutely huge disappointing number. Um, big building. We didn't run the big, big building, but look, we were happy with it. We were. 
Well, I know something else you're happy with every day when you start your day, Jeff, and that's AG one, just one scoop and a cup of water. That's all you need to start your day. Right. I know you do that before you go do your big workouts. I know that because that's what my wife does. And she tells me she's more productive as a result. And I know I'm more productive at work. I don't have that afternoon crash. I've made it a, a daily habit and it really is a micro habit that has macro benefits. It's going to help you do everything that you need. And I mean it, think about it as like whole body health. Think of it as like your foundational nutritional supplement. And, and this is something that is so easy. Seriously. It's just one scoop and a cup of water. And you're going to set yourself up for success because you've got 75 different high quality ingredients. that are going to give you all your key daily nutrients. It's going to support energy and focus and strength and recovery and clarity. Think of it as like your all in one nutritional insurance. If you hate taking pills or vitamins and you actually want something that tastes great, buddy, this is it. And uh, I highly recommend it. I think you're going to experience better gut health, better recovery, better focus, better energy, just sustained clarity, man. I know it works for me. I know it'll work for you and don't just take our word for it. Go look up their reviews. These guys have thousands and thousands and thousands of five-star reviews. And if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, try AG one and get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to drink one.com slash my world. That's drink one.com slash my world. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. All right, Jeff, let's get our matches, man. We're opening up with a barn burner. We got Alex Shelley. He's the last man on a 12 man. X division elimination match that's broken up into team international, which is Tyson ducks, Doug Williams, and Alex Kozlov taking on team Japan, uh, with Milano collection, AT Puma and Masato Yoshino, and also team TNA Shelly and Saban and Curry man. And they're all taking on team Mexico, Ultimo Guerrero, uh, Ray Bucanero and Averno. They go 24 minutes and 16 seconds. You want to talk about a lot of moving parts. Jesus four three-man teams 12 guys and you would think from the outside this is what we've heard in wrestling referred to as a cluster f that is not the case these guys have a fantastic match you should go out of your way to see Meltzer would say it's a spot fest style match with so many great and unique moves and the crowd was more into this than any other match on the show without even knowing most of the participants let me read that again the crowd was more into this match than any other match on the show, even without knowing most of the participants, it gets a four and a quarter star rating. So the fans are not in emotionally invested in the story. They don't have this, uh, they're not bought in and sold and feel emotionally attached or invested to most of the talent, but what you guys pull together in 24 minutes and 16 seconds. Credit to those 12 guys. This had every reason on paper to be a bad idea. And they pulled <laughs> off one heck of a match, Jeff. The philosophy worked. And look, going back to our format, monthly pay-per-views, four two-hour shows, sometimes five, but most of the time four two-hour shows to build that you cannot make every match on the card have this incredible intricate story where people are emotionally invested. But what, what you can do is sell them a lot of action. And specifically in Houston with a very, very high uh, population of Hispanics, the CML crew were obviously heavily featured in this match, but they were kind of the secret sauce, uh, if you will, because the Lucha Libre style, you know, like you said, this could have been a cluster. Uh, and look, some people subjectively, it, they may say, hey, that's not for me. But to start a pay-per-view with a lot of action to get the people up and we're going to put on a hell of a presentation and it's going to be a heck of a roller coaster ride, this definitely was the way to start the show. And again, like you said, hats off to all 12 of them. A fantastic match. Go out of your way to watch it. And let's talk about match two. We want to talk about talent. How about Gail Kim? She's here too. She's going to wrestle Angelina love to six minutes and 13 seconds. Uh, velvet sky is uh, at ringside inter interfering pretty freely to the point where uh, the crowd starts chanting. You screwed Brett and our referee Earl Hebner. Um, 
two and a quarter stars. What'd you think of, uh, of Gail Kim and Angelina love? I mean, Gail Kim is somebody who I think is just ahead of her time. I mean, imagine if she got hot in like 2015, what could have happened with her over the last several years? Uh, what'd you think of this match and, uh, her and Angelina love there look, Gail's phenomenal. J- just does she get her enough flowers? I, I guess through the years she has, but during this time frame. It goes without saying she, her and Kong, but her Gail being the baby face, it's the foundation of the, the, the division, but the beautiful people, the most heat, uh, of, of any of the knockouts. Uh, so it was just, look, they didn't, we, we didn't need a lot of time. We didn't give them a lot of time, but they're both, all three ladies are good storytellers. So it worked. Let's, uh, let's mention match number three, Sanjay Dutt and Jay lethal, uh, Dutt is going to give SoCal Val a rose and a card. She didn't seem thrilled. And when lethal comes out and tours up the tears up the card and destroys the rose, uh, Meltzer would say these two probably could have had a great wrestling match, but this storyline calls for a brawl. The finish was a lethal combination, but lethal then starts worrying about Val Dutt comes from behind and tells Val's he, that Valley loves her takes advantage of lethal using a schoolboy, puts his feet on the ropes and they leave the, uh, match here with the idea that Val is confused. So Sanjay gets the win eight minutes and 24 seconds. It does wind up making the pay-per-view. It's all storyline driven. It has to be a brawl. I think they pulled it off, but I have to say the wrestling fan in me would have liked to have seen what they could have done just having a wrestling match because those guys can do things. Like a, as we're recording this a few days ago, Sanjay Dutt tweeted out a clip of him from the MLW show back in the old days where they did a war games and he jumped from one set of ropes to another, to another, to another down to the floor. And the first time I saw that, like 20 years ago, I remember thinking, whoever that is, I got to watch everything he does. And now just a handful of years after that, he's on this pay-per-view, but we're not really getting in, getting a chance to see him do a lot of that in this. It is more of a brawl, uh, but that's the story and you need story. What'd you think of this? Well, we just talked about a 24 minute exhibition yes. spot fest. Yes. A single match. I don't care who it is. Unless you give them a lot of time with a lot of story, it, they can't follow it trying to do X division style stuff. So the brawl called for it storyline driven. And again, this is one of those things when you get in a room it's, it's, it's not, it's definitely not an exact science, but when you lay out the match order, you have to think things through on, we're starting with 24 minutes of action. All right. We got to go back and give them story. Oh man. No, just the placement and, and the, the ladies match that we just talked about. So it's, it's, it's match placement, which I believe on a three hour or four hour pay-per-view is so critical to, to really feel the ebb and flow and the roller coaster ride of, of a show that, you know, that's where, you know, the, the guys that end up in the main event, they got to deliver the ball is in there. If the ball is giving to them, you know, essentially, you know, fourth and one on the final drive and you got to get the end zone. That's kind of what a main event match has to do. But here we are, you know, in the early part of a pay-per-view Sanjay and Jay storyline driven. They delivered as usual. Next up, we've got homicide and Hernandez retaining the TNA tag titles, beating beer money, which is Robert rude and James storm. It's a lumberjack strap match with the fans as lumberjacks. They flew one fan to Houston who sent in the best video and the other lumberjacks are from Houston and were people who called radio stations that TNA was promoting with. And the right caller got to be a lumberjack. This was like the million dollar giveaway and that this was not a good day for those who argue about wrestling demographics. Jacqueline Moore wasn't at ringside on the guys that she refused to go out there and get whipped. The fans are whipping storm every time he's outside the ring, but never whipped homicide and Hernandez. And after homicide did the three amigos, there was an Eddie chant. There was a similar chant before the show when Hector Guerrero came out and was introduced as part of the Spanish announce team. Homicide mostly sold and hot tagged Hernandez. Rude stayed out of being whipped until the end, and then he got in the ring 
Hernandez puts root on his shoulders and homicide comes off the top with a gringo cutter for the pin. Another case of a match where the stipulations got in the way of the wrestlers doing the match star and three quarters. Listen, we've talked about how fun this is on a house show, but I could see on a pay-per-view how, man, we'd like to have a good match without having crowd participation. What'd you think of the idea and then the execution? If I recall, this is an in-demand, which, which is the cable basically clearinghouse for pay-per-views. They wanted to do flyaway giveaways. And so if we create a match and that's a part of the marketing plan and you know, a fan gets chosen, you got to enter just a contest winner engagement, which got us more commercial time and promotion and the, the pay-per-view systems across the country, you know, it, again, it, it's, it's all marketing that you want to tie back into your product. So I, I think we had to commit to a, um, a, a lumberjack strap match with fans being the lumberjacks. I think we had to commit to not who's in the match, but just the match 120 days out, maybe 90. So that's the kind of things that when you kind of look the devil in the details, like why is that it, you, it's the storytelling, but also the business component, the marketing component. And look, Bobby and James, uh, this is the early days of beer money, but they always delivered in tax situations. And again, playing in leaning into the Hispanic nature of Houston, Hernandez and homicide were, were awesome. Uh, and, and you know, the Eddie chance and everything that went with it. Next up, we got Taylor wild retaining the knockouts title, pinning awesome Kong in four minutes and 51 seconds. The crowd was dead for this one, which is the first time I can recall that kind of reaction for a Kong match. Right. Dave Meltzer. Uh, it is a good match, but man, they just don't know Taylor yet. They're not familiar with her. They're not. Uh, they're not bought in just yet, but she does steal a win. The finish would see Kong go for a choke slam while it turns it into a front rolling cradle. And then afterwards they're going to start to attack her and it looks like they're going to put the beat down. Then here comes abyss and, uh, Meltzer would say his new role is to save people from being bullied. And, uh, yeah, there's a little man on woman violence here where abyss gives Saeed a black hole slam. What'd you think of, uh, I mean, listen, it tells a nice story where she upsets awesome Kong and wins the belt. I think most people would assume she's going to get destroyed at the pay-per-view. You don't do that. Do you regret in hindsight, not just going back with, uh, with Kong here and putting Kong over. Yeah. It would just wasn't time. And again, I'm going to go back into match placement, really hard to follow a lumberjack strap match where the fans are actually engaged because yes. those 20 fans go back to their seats. They're not into watching wrestling for the next 10 or 15 minutes. They're into telling their buddies. Yeah. Did you see, what happened. see that? Did you? Yeah. So a, a tough spot. Uh, and, and look, ultimately we wanted to keep the belt on Taylor. We didn't want to hurt Kong. So we did the afterbirth and everything that went with it. And look, we were starting down the road with kind of a fresh coat of paint on abyss. Let's do uh match number six. Um, Volador Jr. wins the Ultimate X and X Cup, X Cup tournament for Team Mexico in a four way over Kaz, Davari, and Naruki Dow. Uh, Meltzer would say probably the weakest Ultimate X match to date 10 minutes and 58 seconds. Uh, listen, it's, it's a crazy, crazy match with crazy spots. You got the cables above the ring. Uh, Meltzer would say Davari was climbing and about to get the belt when Kaz jumped off the stands that the cables were tied to in the corner with a leg drop on Davari, who was hanging from the cable almost in the middle of the ring. The spot was completely nuts. Kaz injured his hip because I don't see how you can pull that move off safely since it's essentially jumping far off a 13 foot platform and landing on your hip and tailbone. It wasn't serious. He's not expected to miss any significant time. Uh, man, what a moment, what a spot. What do you remember about this one? And then Meltzer says maybe the weakest to date it says a lot about the expectations of the match with a memorable spot like that. Kaz knew how to work it. The other guys, it, it just, whether it's rehearsal time, which I don't recall, they weren't, I don't say comfortable, the style, they were unfamiliar with what needed to be done. And that's, you know, that's. You know, on the one hand, that really 
tip your cap to AJ and Frankie and others that knew how to work an Ultimate X match, and but but they had done it through several trial and error and all that. Those guys coming in had no experience in it, and and that was that was the downside of it. Period. Next up, we've got uh, a co-main event almost. It's Kurt Angle and Team 3D taking on AJ Styles, Christian Cage, and Rhino. They go 15-55 in a full metal mayhem, which, of course, is TNA's version of a TLC match. Uh, we can't call it that, of course. Uh, Melzer would say this was supposed to be fans voting on a website, picking different steps, but they all made it clear what they wanted people to pick. It came across as really low rent, as they never showed a graphic during the show of the choices, although they mentioned it a few times in commentary. And before the match started, Jeremy Borash got in the ring without a graphic and said the fans have picked a full metal mayhem match. The ladders weren't used nearly to the extent of a WWE style match, but they did break numerous tables and used a plethora of garbage can shots. The problem is that TNA does these brawls so often, um, that particularly involving team 3d, they've lost any impact. Messer says it was a very good match though. Uh, they do eventually bump Earl Hebner. And of course, uh, Frank Trigg is going to get involved in the end, Kurt angle and team 3d pick up the win. It's an Olympic slam off a ladder through a table. What a finish three and three quarter stars. What do you think in hindsight? Should we have played up the fans are doing the voting and showed more graphics and all that? Or is that a small detail? Not a big deal. It's an execution. And as you can tell by the fan strap match, there was a, a, a real um, mindset. I'll call it as much fan engagement website. Uh, tr just trying to, you know, these are the early days of YouTube for us or early days of, of just trying to create as much fan interaction as we possibly can in demand. Like I said, they wanted to fly someone in. So that was that match again, trying to create a fan engagement, our execution on the fans voting, but it was. I mean, when you have Team 3D in a match, they're going to vote for that, period. Um, and, and look, those guys know how to work that style of match. Rhino knows. I'm not saying AJ and Kurt don't, but, you know, you put a Rhino, you you, you just, all, all of it t together, just, they know they know how to make those matches click, and it did. It, it's a hell of a match. Would you say, old Uncle Dave, what rating? Uh, yeah, he liked it. I mean, he, he, uh, all right. Three and three quarters. That's pretty good for him. Yeah. Especially in that style match with those six. Yeah. If it's got gimmicks and props, he ain't usually with it. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, listen, Kurt angle, even though he's writing at the time, boy, he's in trouble and people are concerned. Won the match, stole the show three and three quarters. Like exactly. Exactly. Next first, same as the first. So it, it's, it's a hard thing to be upset with uh, Mr. Angle when he's still in the show every week. Yep. Uh, main event time. Here we go. Samoa Joe and Booker T to a no contest in 15 minutes and 54 seconds. Uh, Meltzer would say before the match, Joe and Kevin Nash were backstage and Nash told Joe he'd be in his corner to the end. And he apologized and Joe made Nash promise no matter what happened to stay in the back. Since Nash is the baby face in this program, I guess when he said, yes, it wasn't a swerve, which given it was TNA actually made it a swerve. The crowd was strongly pro Booker. Joe is going to root uh, juice early referee. Rudy Charles is taken out first. Joe does the Ole Ole kick on Booker right in front of Charmel. She's out of control and slaps Joe. Joe then decks her security guy who was one of Booker's trainees at the school. Joe runs Booker into the post and he's bleeding. Charmel goes crazy and tells Joe to stop. And Joe continues to beat on Booker while Charmel is pleading for someone to help. They run in security. Joe takes them out as well as referees one by one. Finally, Joe puts Booker in the choke. Sting comes out and tells Booker to stop and it's over. Reluctantly, Joe leaves the ring with Sting. And the expectation was that he'd attack Sting, but instead he jumped back in the ring and attacked Booker. And then Sting turned around and got back in the ring. Joe flipped him off and Sting hit Booker with bat shots. While all of this is going on, Mike Tanay and Don West were asking what gave Sting the authority to do what he's been doing. And then Charmel put Booker's arm on top of Joe and counted to three. She grabbed the belt, handed it to Booker and helped him to the back. 
Meltzer would say exactly how many times have we seen the challenger steal the belt in TNA? So three stars, but I think a lot of people, when they see this backstage conversation happen with Nash, they think, well, he's definitely coming now and he doesn't, but when sting does, and instead of saving Booker, he just piles on with the bat shots. I don't know, man. In hindsight, is this the right execution? Subjective pal. I can remember kind of having the debate of not really giving him a finish. And then the counterpoint was, but we are giving them a very definitive sting outcome going a completely different direction than anybody expected down to the Nash, not coming everything to go with it. Conrad, you know, in hindsight, should we've got to finish with Joe over before? I mean, look, we can talk about this forever and be so subjective with it and, and kind of be correct on a couple of different vibes. But at the end of the day, we all headed in this direction. Um, and I cannot remember for the life of me, you know, I should have looked this up. That's one of the things, um, where we went with sting the next month, that's for another podcast, but it's the decision we made period. Was it the right decision? The people, let me just say this, the people in the arena, because it's Houston's hometown. I'm not so sure they were completely bought in. No. The, uh, the beat down on Joe and just the way sting was used here and that it's a non-finish. Yeah. Boy, the torch was awfully I bet they carved it up and probably rightly so. Uh, he writes, it was a confusing overbooked clusterfuck main event that can leave a bad taste in your mouth. Even if everything else was pretty solid, the finish seemed to dampen the enthusiasm of what was otherwise a good show. Unfortunately, because of everything leading up to that was good to great. And Wade Keller would say he felt the main event had quote, a good start to what had been a decent match, but that it was quote, far from a satisfying finish. And, uh, yeah. James Caldwell also says he was there in the crowd and he says the main event had a terrible, terrible finish, which killed the crowd. And he said it was one of the worst finishes he had ever seen. So lots of people are, cre- are critical about the creative. I mean, we got sting here. We got Kevin Nash here. We got Booker T in his hometown. We got Samoa Joe. I mean, if you had it to do over again, would this be one of the few main events you would have done a little differently here's the simplistic thing there's got to be a way to slip joe over and tell all that same story and i yeah. feel like that was what my vote would have been but then when you get into politics and discussions you can lean into yeah you're kind of right we don't want to do that oh we don't want to do that or, or you know do we get nash out there again the subjectivity of it but to me so many things can be cured and Dutch Mantel's mantra that I think he became so good at, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a simple philosophy. It's it literally, I've heard it out of his mouth. A good, I don't know how many times give him a finish and tell your story. Give him a finish and tell your story. Give him a finish and tell your story. If we could have gotten Joe over that's, you know, and I know there was out, you know, on the backside of this on impacts and, who showed up at the belt and who did this and who did that. And, you know, uh, sting turned heels, the highlight coming out of it and all that kind of stuff. But had I do over again, probably put Joe over and then tell the rest of that story. And then you would have had a, to me, a different vibe of at least the people in the audience go, all right, that's the outcome of the match. And now here's the story. As opposed to wait, I don't really care for that finish. That wouldn't that didn't work. Oh, wait. Now you're trying to force feed us from story. It just too much, man. Too much to unpack, too much to swallow. What it's building to is the next month. Um, we're gonna do a six sides of steel weapons match with Samoa Joe and Booker T. That's at hard justice in August. But we'll talk about that. Uh, in the coming months here on the program. And we know that the main event mafia stuff is right around the corner as is 
uh, bound for glory 2008 uh, in the coming weeks actually next week we're going to be talking about all of your silly gimmick matches you mentioned a minute ago that there used to be just pages and pages of them so whether it's six sides of steel or ultimate x or things on poles or the king <laughs> of the mountain we're going to talk about all that stuff next week and if you can't get enough gimmick matches let me mention that tomorrow on what happened when with tony Schiavone, we're watching the nitro where they put viagra on a pole match and yes. it was and it was announced of course that we're building towards judy bagwell on a pole beautiful so if you like gimmick matches there's a straight jacket <laughs> match on that one too just a regular ass nitro from cincinnati no big deal uh, <laughs> tune in to tony Schiavone tomorrow for that by uh, the way you would have already heard that if you would have joined us on adfreeshows.com uh, you not only get these shows early you get them ad free and you can even be a part of our live studio audience we had a bit of a, an intermission here on our recording today and I want to give a shout out to everybody who were hanging out yes thank you. lopez or joe morris or zoel lopez or bryant or kelly or richie ray or coach rosie or denovius i mean everybody who showed up greatly appreciate you guys hanging out with us uh, why not join us over at adfreeshows.com you'll get great bonus content like the false finish a new series that's exclusive for ad free shows we've done them with chris harris and now glacier these are great long form conversations about how they got over and how they got out of the professional wrestling business uh, it is a fantastic series. I'm really, really proud of, and I'm equally as proud of the book, a brand new project. We started this year. We're going episodically month by month mm. with a member of wrestling royalty. David Crockett opens up his brother's red books, these famous booking sheets when the excellent penmanship of JJ Dillon from the genius booking mind of dusty Rhodes. month by month. We're breaking it down, including July, which featured the very first great American bash. Wow. and the debut of the rock and roll express and the clash that set wow. a record between the nature boys of buddy landell versus rick flair and oh by the way the month that jcp got into the vhs business a lot of moving parts if you love professional wrestling and you love nostalgia you'll love the book and you'll love a brand new series we're debuting right now called making the town where we're focusing and highlighting on some of the more famous wrestling buildings and who better to kick off our very first episode than the blue meanie talking to us about the ECW arena, a place that was so famous that when it came time for me to take my senior trip in high school, all my friends went to Cancun. I went to the corner of Swanson and Rittner. Uh, <laughs> and maybe my favorite new thing I'm doing every week, it's on Tuesdays. So next week, or a matter of fact, today, when you finish Jeff's podcast, go sign up at adfreeshows.com. And on Tuesday afternoons, you can enjoy Tuesdays with the Taskmaster. Kevin Sullivan has a podcast, and he and I are chopping it up, answering your questions. You pick the topic. You want to talk about a wrestling historian. Mm -hmm. My man has forgot more about wrestling than most people will ever know, and you get to pick his brain exclusively every week on adfreeshows.com. How did I do, Jeff? Did I sell adfreeshows.com pretty hard today? In the towns, I cannot wait. That's, That's all, fun, isn't it? Oh, heck yeah. There's a lot of a lot of meat on the bone there, pal. Lots and lots. And there's lots of meat on the bone for your business. We'd love to have the opportunity to advertise for you here on our program. You hear some of the same ads over and over and over. Uh, it's easy for us to advertise your product. Just go sign up right now. Let us know you want more information at advertisewithjarrett.com. Be sure to follow us on social media. Our show handles are at MyWorldPod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And the easiest, cheapest, best way to support us online is by checking out our YouTube. That's my world on youtube.com. That's my world on youtube.com. Tons of great merch too available over at box And I can't believe this is a thing, Jeff, but by the time folks are hearing this, they will have heard of a name at a wrestling convention. They never thought they would hear. I love it. I'm pumped. One you're going to be excited about. We are what's today. So yeah, we've got five weeks the next five weeks wow i'll just say that we're gonna have a lot of fun we're yes. gonna have a lot of fun and i've got uh, messages on my phone i have to translate so i'm gonna put that in a machine and translate it and i'll let you know what that says Me too. we're working hard for you s-t-a-r-r-c-a-s-t.com starcast is coming your way labor day weekend hey before i let you go jeff i want to brag on our success you know we uh we like to have a lot of fun playing grab ass, talk about wrestling, but in our real life, you know, I have a passion for helping people save money 
And right now there's a lot of people who are kind of nervous. They're thinking, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Well, let me go ahead and give you a pro tip. If you're carrying a credit card balance and your interest rate is like 18 to 28 to 33%, because I'm seeing those, man, you know, there's got to be a better way and I can help. We just saved one of our listeners, Jeff, $681 a month. Wow. That is a heck of a nice car payment. And they're saving that right now. Not, not they save $681 one time. They save $681 this month, next month, the month after that in perpetuity now, or so it would seem because they were on a 30 year loan. Now they're down to just 20 years. So they got rid of all their credit card debt. They're going to lower monthly payment to the tune of $681 a month. They got a greater tax deduction. See the interest you pay American express or capital one or discover not tax deductible, whereas the interest you pay on your mortgage is tax deductible. And oh, how about this? No house payments for two months. If you haven't already, you don't have to make your August or your September payment. You're done until October 1st. So what would you do with an extra $681 a month? We'll find out how much money you can save right now for free at savewithconrad.com. We've got an A plus with the BBB. Don't take my word for it. Go read our reviews at conradreviews.com. You'll find more than a thousand five-star reviews there. And yes, we're licensed in your state too. It's called no cost, no obligation. And if we can't save you some cash, we won't waste your time. But $681 a month, Jeff, that's a lot of money. I'd say so. That buys, uh, that buy my groceries. I was fixed to say that buy a lot of groceries, almost enough for Jeff. <laughs> that's it. Uh, Hey, I also want to mention we're in an environment right now where people know that interest rates are a little higher than they normally are. I often say on this program, I want to repeat it now. I want to be your mortgage advisor for life. So we offer a seven year guarantee, meaning if your needs change in the next seven years, you get transferred, you decided you want to put in a pool in the back. Uh, you just want to refinance and get a lower rate because the rates are lower and you can do that. Or maybe your needs have changed. Maybe, Hey, the kids are going off and now we need to do something different. We'll go ahead and help you refinance without charging you a whole new set of second closing costs. <clears throat> your origination, which is what you normally pay someone like me to do your loan. We're not charging that the second go around. We want to be your mortgage advisor for life. So I'm saying all that to say, get the peace of mind of knowing you stop paying that crazy interest on your credit cards right now. No more of that minimum payment stuff. No more over the limit stuff. No more crazy 28 and 33% interest. And when the rates get lower again on your mortgage, we'll refinance you again without you having to come out of pocket for a whole new set of closing costs. We're going to get rid of our origination. Our commission is on the house. Yes, you'll still have to pay recording costs and things like that. We don't decide what your county charges, but as far as what we're charging, we're going to hook you up. We want to be your mortgage advisor for life. I mentioned that Jeff, because there's a lot of people that I've been talking to in recent months who've said, you know, I, I'm stuck. I got this crazy high car payment and I got these credit cards that are just killing me, but I got a great rate on my mortgage. I don't want to let go of that. So I guess what I'll do is I'll keep my 4% mortgage and I'll just keep my 28% credit cards. What are you doing? Like, don't be penny wise dollar foolish. Like uh, let's look at what you're paying. Let's get the lowest rate we can. Let's get the greatest tax deduction we can. Let's lower our monthly payments and imagine how much faster you can pay yourself off and pay all that debt off. If you take that monthly savings and just chip away at the principal, Jeff, it's a lot of savings, a lot of opportunity. You don't have to know how to do that. I can do all that. It all starts with a quick phone call or just checking us out at savewithconrad.com. Beautiful, pal. Hey, man, I had fun today. Never know what to expect when we sit down with you, but I'm excited about next week. I think it's going to be a little silly. It's going to be oh, a little fun. We're talking we got, about gimmick matches. We got gimmick matches. We're going to be talking about in another episode, all the celebrities I've worked with, it's a, we've got the schedule is fun. I looked at it this weekend. A lot of good stuff, pal. Appreciate your wow. time today. Hall of Famer. Hey man, nice of you to say, be sure to make plans to join Jeff and I at Starcast S T A R R C A S T.com. Before we get there, go ahead and pre-order wrestle quest coming out on April 8th. Oh man. If you're, sorry. August 8th. I just knew it started with a, <laughs> uh, and also in August, AEW in Nashville. How about a home game for you? You don't I, have to fly I, that way. You ain't kidding, pal. It's going to be nice. Bridgestone Arena. It's going to be, be nice. It's going to be nice. Well, we'll see you guys sooner rather than later, right here on my world. Peace.